From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars, pop culture, pop culture business, and the ultimate adventure, <laughs> life itself. I'm Ken Napson. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Jennifer Landa, and this is the Star Wars Biz. I love that. <laughs> Star Wars Biz. This is our Star Wars news show, breaking news from a long time ago, or articles from last week. We're going to cover uh, one article in depth from the Hollywood Reporter, and we're going to pass through, but in a substantive, uh, substantive way, uh, of the Variety article uh, that was kind of the news. Otherwise, it would have been us talking about, you know, f figure leaks and, and, and minor things, which are always fun. And we love discussing the fun stuff, but we're going to dig in deep to some Star Wars news uh, this past week about those articles. You know the ones. Wink, wink. Hey, before we do all that... We're going to tell you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. It's true. A free trial at audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Over 180,000 titles and rising to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. A little bit uh, ago in our Force Center Discord, some of our listeners started posting, like, their MP3 players from the past Ooh, or audio awesome. devices. Ooh. Yes. Fun. Yes. As always, we're recommending a, a book for you that, to try out, and we are recommending Shadow of the Sith by Adam Christopher. Yes, a uh, great story set in the sequel era that leads up and uh, to uh, Rise of Skywalker from a certain point of view. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash force center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audio book before my voice apparently starts to go. Joseph, <laughs> you've got some asks for us. That's right. Uh, we are so thankful mm -hmm. for everyone who has supported us on Patreon, who continues to support us on Patreon. Uh, so we are trying to get our numbers up a little bit on Patreon. We are back up over 400. We have a goal to hit 415 paid patrons at which point we'll do an exclusive live stream uh, but we i think we called it a private live stream last time which live makes it sound like something stream. Well, yeah well maybe i'll unbox an action figure or something real private like that <laughs> <laughs> no metaphor literally mm. unboxing an action figure we'll do something uh fun and uh special to celebrate with the paid patrons so check that out if you want uh we have also left x uh, so if you want to follow us on Blue Sky and Threads, thank you to a lot of people who have been following us on Blue Sky uh, in particular. I uh, encourage you to join us over there. Uh, that is it for the asks. Uh, do we want to talk about life adventures at all? We should talk about life adventures. Uh, part of my life adventure was seeing a great post from you on Threads uh, summarizing why I'm on Threads. I enjoy being on there, but I also I'm having some problems with it. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for that. You. You expressed my sentiments well, sir. Uh, anyways, yeah, that is a Jed life adventure. Better yeah. than mine. Uh, adventures in the dollhouse. I have been struggling with my diorama for my Blythe doll. What kind of setup do I want to do? Do I want to do a living mm. room? Do I want to do? Mm -hmm. And then I had the thought where I was like, I'm going to make her a special Star Wars or nerd den, basically, is what I want, okay. which is what I want in my real okay. life, but I can't yeah. have it because I don't have the space. So yeah. she will have it. And I have. I went to Target and I got mini, like these little mini verse things, but for myself. And I've seen my kids open this and it felt very like weird to be in my bedroom slowly unwrapping this little thing. <laughs> and you guys, I, I scored big time. It was a Disney one, Disney nice. little ball. You open it up. I got, and I didn't know what I was going to get. I could have gotten Elsa, right? Could have mm. gotten mm. Marvel, which no shade of Marvel, not my thing. I got. A Nightmare for Christmas, Sally, tiny little mm. figure, nice. and a Mando figure. Ooh. Okay. Ah, and I think I got a Marvel. I think I got Doctor uh, Doctor Strange, I think. <laughs> nice. Whatever. Jen, I'll go Jen on the just, shelf. She throws the figure away. I don't know. Why not. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Joseph, do you want it? Sure. It's tiny. Yeah. It's tiny. Oh, good. I don't have much space left. So I'll put a <laughs> tiny you. Doctor Strange to accidentally step on. Ah. Yeah, but that was a thrill. And I just was like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. The universe is telling me you're calling as miniatures. <laughs> Star Wars and miniatures coming together. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. A oh. Great adventure. And it's yeah. Din, the character is Din, the Mando, or is it just a Mandalorian? Yes, it is Din. Okay. I actually need, I need to put my glasses on, though, to look at it again, because it, it could be another, it could be Boba Fett. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look that closely. Uh, oh, yeah. yes. I probably need to get some glasses that are readers, but they should be called uh, miniature lookers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I have my readers. 
Yeah, this is this is it. This is uh, we are uh, Star Wars is approaching. Uh, you know, we've got fifty years plus of Lucasfilm, and our, uh, us uh, older fans. We're here to represent the quote older fans who now have to get readers to look at their Star Wars books and toys. <laughs> my minifigures. That's I'm like going to be a grandma over there looking at my my minifigures. Hey, now see, this is a Tobias Beckett. You see, he was a mentor. <laughs> the coolest uh, grandma around. Uh, yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, my life adventures were, were rather direct and simple. I had a fun wedding. Shout out to a mm. friend of Force Center, former Force Center guest, uh, Emma Fife and oh. uh, Gabe. They got married. Uh, very nice. a wonderful, like low key affair. Like it was just such a wonderful, simple ceremony at a, at a, at a wonderful location that was both the the, re- the re- ceremony in the reception spot. Uh, uh, our friend Darina DJed. I got to dance mm. to Hot to cool. Go. Um, before my my back went out and I had to kind of go, um, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, shout out to uh, uh, an old friend uh, from the uh, pop culture pungentry wars. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to Emma and uh, Gabe. Uh, and then a quick Star Wars note for me. You know, I just have, have had to. We, we collectively have had to kind of like put aside the comics or put aside the books. Just it was a time thing, and mm-hmm. and it kind of sucks sometimes. I I don't necessarily miss being so. Uh, drowning in Star Wars literature that uh, I wonder what the real world is like, but uh, I sometimes miss it. And I was catching up with uh, Molly and Alex's Q&A videos. I often do on my Saturday mornings over breakfast, and they were describing the new Battle of Jakku, 12-issue comic run that's starting to come out. And I, I, I like stood up. I sat up in my seat. I was like, ooh, I even text Alex. I was like, this, this is out now? This sounds good. This sounds great. Uh, so, like, you know, Battle of Jakku, going back to 2015, going back actually to 2014 when we see kind of the first images of Jakku and Ray's speeder, uh, has been one of my favorite little, uh, I don't know, little bits of history in Star Wars. And this is, is kind of pulling together a lot of pieces over the last 10 years that have been dropped. That includes, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yuptashu, uh, Acolytes Beyond, some of the other kind of aspects of Battle of Jakku. And it's kind of putting it all in one little story. So, um I'm excited to dive in. And that was good news. That's my Star Wars adventure. Excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I had that Star exact same Star Wars adventure. I watched uh, Alex and Molly's uh, Q&A. And yeah, I liked uh, I, it was great to get caught up on that. The comic book is doing a little bit of a cleanup on Isle of Jakku uh, because <laughs> early, <laughs> early in the canon, you know, there'd be lots of different fun stories. And it's one of those like, oh, I know this person had this fight here and this person had this fight there and this person was affected yep. this way. And it's a, a myth about whether Luke was there or not and what he did. And, uh, right. I can't wait for the trade paperback because trying yes. to keep up with the stories issue by issue is hard for me. So I look forward same. to that. Same. Um, same. You? My other Star Wars adventure is I remembered that two years ago I bought the spooky clone trooper uh, Halloween uh, Black Series figure oh, that yeah. has a glow-in-the-dark skeleton and comes with a little porg dressed in a Count Dracula vampire suit. Right, right. But, uh, some, n- some problems sometimes with Hasbro. Uh, that Halloween uh, figure arrived on, I believe, around November 5th in 2022. <laughs> and then last year, I really wanted to have fun sharing it, but the strike was oh, still going on, and I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. So this year, I got I dug it out, and it's I'm waiting for the right moment of Halloween joy to open the clone trooper and vampire Borg. <laughs> Love it. Love yeah. It. So I can get that. That's a good, good stuff there. Um, my wife and I watched the horror movie, Megan, uh, Jennifer, have you watched Megan? Mm. No, I want to see, is it good? Is it too scary uh, though? Is it scary? No, it's, it's, it, it, I don't think it's very scary. And that's one of the dings against it is it, it it's PG 13 okay. and it, I, oh. I don't think it's too terribly scary. Good. Um, but I did really enjoy it, and I thought you would uh, after all of your your doll talk. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I want to see it. I saw some great costumes last Halloween around that. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, and only other thing really for me is I, I'm eating, sleeping, occasionally spending some time with my wife doing Four Center, and then my entire rest of my existence is working on this movie, uh, trying to uh, get it up and get everything uh, set uh, to film it relatively soon. Um, and in that regard, last week uh, I talked a little bit about the IMDb star meter uh, thing where uh, if you pay for the back end IMDb Pro, you can see that everybody has a star meter, uh, which has some actual real power in the real world. Um, but it is just uh, created based on how many people have looked uh, at your profile. It is an experiment. Talked about it uh, uh, last week and uh, asked for Center Watcher listeners to check it out <laughs> uh, and just click on my link. And uh, it, 
it worked. Um, yeah. My uh, rating uh, last week was, it refreshes every Monday, uh, was 300,000 something. Uh, this morning, it was 42,000 something. So Holy uh, moly, that's huge. Four center listeners, watchers dropped wow. it by like 200,000, 150,000. That's uh, really good. Which is like, it's not going to stay there. Next week, it'll go right back up unless people just kind of make it a part of their daily routine of like, just every morning I get up and I, I eat my oatmeal and I check Joseph's IMDb page, <laughs> like, which I'm not asking people to do. Anyway, so oh, I wanted to thank amazing. you all for that uh, sort of Battle of Exegol moment. Thank you. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, that's, that's beautiful. That's, that's important. It's important. Just set an alarm, folks. Set an alarm. Wake up every morning. <laughs> no, like, no. Like, Click. Gotta check on Scrimshaw. Gotta check on Scrimshaw. Uh, there we go. Life is a collection of ratings. We're going to get to a Star Wars news. Uh, it's a, a twofold. We got a, a bigger in-depth conversation coming here on the Hollywood Reporter article that asks the question, is Disney bad at Star Wars? But before we do that, we wanted to take a swing through the Variety article that also came out uh, that was about uh, toxic fandom. But out of that emerged a uh, kind of a, a bit of uh, news, a revelation that kind of became its own whirlwind of a story. But we're going to dive into that, Joseph. Uh, you've got the uh, angle on this Variety <laughs> Yeah, so I saw a lot of the um, uh, uh, outlets that are not Variety sharing their own take. And as we've talked about many times, and as everybody knows, uh, uh, I think uh, headlines are, are spun to be the most inflammatory right now to, to drive engagement. Um, so I eventually went and checked out the article. And the article is primarily about toxic fandom and I think really important and really great. And I think it reflects a lot of things that, that we've been discussing on Force Center. I know many other shows have as well about the, the challenge of separating out good faith fans who just didn't enjoy something. This particular show wasn't for them uh, versus extremely uh, bad faith uh, fans or frankly, non-fans who are attacking things simply because, you know, different people are involved. Um, frankly, just being racist, sexist, xenophobic, homophobic, all those things. So the article is mainly talking about working through how do you deal with the fandoms that are so intense, uh, but can come with so much baggage. I think very important, very good. Uh, but there's also a brief part of the article that discusses uh, fan focus groups. And that's the headline that really got uh, ran with on other outlets. And what I saw a lot of people reacting to. Uh, so then I wanted to pull out the actual quote from this article about the fan focus groups. Here's what it says. In addition to standard focus group testing, studios will assemble a specialized cluster of super fans to assess possible marketing materials for a major franchise project. Uh, quote from a studio executive, they're very vocal. They will just tell us if you do that, fans are going to retaliate. These groups have even led studios to alter the projects. Again, the studio executive being quoted, if it's early enough and the movie isn't finished yet, we can make those kinds of changes. So for me and what I want to discuss with both of you, A, this is mainly talking about marketing about showing them trailers, posters, and going, D do you think that's good? Uh, which isn't different from standard focus groups. And even with the more, uh, how is it going to affect the projects? Uh, my interpretation is more that, hey, if you're looking at it really early on, people might go, hey, that's not the right lightsaber for Maul. And if we have time, we'll change it. I don't get any any suggestion from this that it's like, we finished a first draft <laughs> yeah. and we're showing our super fans the script and we're asking them, should Mando, you know, uh, uh, leave Grogu or not? And they're going rewrite like, and I mm -hmm. feel that that is sort of the, the way that the article was being discussed with news was being discussed is that fans are being invited early into the process to dictate storytelling. Whereas the actual mm -hmm. quote to me, is about asking focus groups about, hey, do you like this? Do you think other people would like this? And then if they get a negative response, the creators can go, do we want to respond to that? Do we not want to respond to that? Um, so I, I I feel like it's, um, I definitely have some concerns about <laughs> fans dictating storytelling. I'm not a fan of that, but I also feel like maybe there was an overreaction to a headline. Jennifer, what are your thoughts? I think, 
There's a lot because number one, if it's just the marketing materials and you're assembling this team of super fans, um, that makes sense to me. But I want to know who, what is the makeup of these fans? Is it a diverse group of people? Is it not? I would hope that it would be, right? What are their values? Like, ah, uh, I want to see a wide variety of people represented there. That's really important for mm -hmm. me. Uh, but you guys were talking about something off air, which I think is a really important thing that I had forgotten. Like there's always test screenings and there's stories for years about movie endings being changed because it didn't land with the, with the audience. Right. And the creator is like, Oh, that's not the way that I wanted it to be. I'm okay with that. Um, I don't know if you necessarily like having super fans be a part of that. Those test screenings could be really helpful. But what scares me is that I think a lot of, not a lot. There's a certain group of fans that want to be in on this early process where they think, <laughs> even though these people are not writers or creatives in any way, but they got ideas and they believe that they should be involved with J.J. Abrams or Dave Filoni in that room being like, no, that's not the way it should be. My Luke Skywalker wouldn't do that. That's dangerous. But I don't think that that's what this article is saying. That's the, I don't I don't get it from that. I I understand there's some ambiguity of if it's early enough and the movie isn't finished yet, we can make those kinds of changes. Those kinds of changes are isn't entirely clear to me. Um, but I kind of feel like if it's early enough, you know, I, I don't think they're responding in any different way than standard focus testing. Like you show people a movie and the uncle character makes a makes a choice that makes sense to the creator, but every audience you show it to, sixty percent of the audience goes. I don't I I, I was loving this movie and then it really pissed me off that the uncle did that and I don't understand why and you and you get then you have that decision as a creator like is it is it important enough to me that I stick with it even though I have evidence that the majority of the audience is lost in that moment mm -hmm. David Lynch who is an auteur wild at heart had one scene with a long torture scene that just broke people people left the theater and they're like Ooh. I was enjoying the movie and I had to leave and even David Lynch was like Okay, the torch. I, I didn't realize it was going to bug people that much, so I'll cut down the torture scene. The film won the Palme d'Or at, at Cannes. It, it it it's a conversation, and I don't care about standard focus groups going. I think you should change this, and then the creators going, "Do we want to listen or not?" And I think that's what's being said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I took it. Uh, I, I admit to not fully reading the article until uh, this weekend when, when Joseph, you said we should we should probably swing through this with a little more depth because it, it, on the surface, it, it, it spins out, like you said. So a lot of folks like ang angry about that one little section, um, angry about some of the um, pictures used in it, which I'll come to in a second. But uh, I, I, but I do think it, this is not new. Uh, this is this is a longstanding problem. I, I just think of George Lucas telling the story of uh, uh, not even the story, but just saying, you know, all the families who made films in, in, in the early part of the uh, 20th century sold to corporations. So by the time I'm coming up, uh, that's why they grabbed the young filmmakers from USC because none of them knew how to do it. It was product, and then they get their hands all over it, right? Without Alan Ladd Jr., I don't think there is Star Wars. Uh, mm -hmm. Because he he was mm -hmm. uh, he understood the the, the, the the value of an artist, um, but that didn't you know. But then cut to three years later, four years later, the budget Empire Strikes Back. Alan Ladd has, Jr. has to walk out on 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 20th Century Fox in his job because of the battle that goes on, and that's summarizing a, a story. I know, but yeah. So this is all uh, not new. I think it just it felt like a win, right? There's so much tension going on right now. Um, it, it, it feels like uh, two sides of an army standing at Helm's Deep, uh, ready <laughs> for the battle, and, and someone's going to accidentally fire the first arrow. And this felt like a win, and I think that's what a lot of the tweets were coming from. But when you break it down, I don't think it's new. I think everyone – you can look at – Sonic is an example that everyone goes to of the eyes come out. And everyone throws an uproar, and it puts the movie – back into production. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it was the choice. Maybe it was a bad choice, but it was a choice that they made. And that caused a lot of workers, especially on the animation side, to go back and in, into the trenches. It's a bigger conversation, but I think that's what ma makes everyone, th they think about it when they hear about this stuff. Um, but I, I, at the end of the day, I don't think it's nothing to do. And I thought the article actually was a step forward in addressing some of the truth around what's been going on the last year, five 10 years of movie fandom. And that was a plus for me.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and being honest about how much uh, people are attacked and what are the the uh, mm -hmm. studio's responsibilities for uh, prepping and defending people who are being attacked before a show even comes out, before there's any chance for good faith people to go, I don't like this performance, I didn't enjoy this story, and being attacked simply uh, for being who they are and daring to yep. be in a project. That stuff is an Im incredibly important conversation. That's what the majority of the article is about. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the last thing I'll say is uh, focus groups are a reality because the, the Hollywood is and always has been a mix of soulful, beautiful art and commerce. It's money making. It's show business, the show in the business. Um, and I don't think that uh, uh, show business ultimately uh, benefits from leaning on pre input from an audience too much. Um, I feel like Hollywood had kind of learned that lesson. Uh, with snakes on a plane <laughs> and is in danger of forgetting it. And I, I hope that it doesn't happen. I, I looked up snakes on a plane to make sure I remembered it correctly. It wasn't a massive bomb, but it was, it was something cost something like 30 or 40 million and made 60 million. Uh, but for people who, Hey, maybe weren't alive in 2006 or paying attention. Uh, they announced a film called snakes on a plane with uh, Samuel Jackson and the whole internet at the time, even pre social media said it must include a line where Samuel L. Jackson says there are too many MF planes or snakes on this MF plane. They did a bunch of viral uh, uh, marketing, which was, you know, unprecedented and had huge viral interest. And then it did okay the first weekend and dropped massively the second weekend and did fine because people were like, yep, it was snakes on a plane and Samuel L. Jackson swore like we told him to. And feels like this movie was written by a bunch of people yelling on the internet. Um, and nobody liked it. And there's, here's the quote from uh, 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 Wikipedia. Box office analysts have subsequently referred to substantial internet discourse failing to materialize into box office as the snakes on a plane effect. Um, so I'm not mm -hmm. too worried about fan focus groups taking over because it's been tried in the past and it didn't work. And, and, and studio executives are probably coming up with worth, worse ideas and decisions and wedging them into films and TV shows or trying to. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, uh, I would agree. <laughs> this is, this is, you know, God, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember my friend was telling me how he pitched a TV show years ago and, and he's a, he used to be brought in to make pitches. He was so good at it. At one point, the executive misunderstood because he wasn't listening and was like, oh, great. And she's pregnant, right? And, and my friend would, yep. Yep, she is. She's pregnant. She's pregnant. Now they had a character that was pregnant that wasn't pregnant. Like they, they, they don't care. They're 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 counting their money. It's a product, and that's uh, the downside. You got to find those good studio executives that get it. I think Feige rises because he got it at least at one point early on. Uh, mm -hmm. One final thing I want to say before we move on, Joseph, was uh, there was some um, again after reading the whole article and taking it in. There, there was a uh, I saw some uh, commotion around the picture uh, used uh, and attached with this article. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where it was uh, women and people of color and, 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 a, and a very a fan favorite queer moment from House of the Dragon and Brie Larson and everything. And a lot of people were like upset that, that was, um, those were the photos used. But I, I think that was the point. I think that's the point of what's going on here. Um, and, and that should stand out to you of like, hey, this, this is what's causing some of the kerfluffle on – you know, what we t the bad faith actors. Yeah, that's what it is. And that's what we got to run into head on and fight. It's one thing to sit down with a focus group and go, I, I don't know if Tolkien would have liked that bow and arrow. It's the other thing to say, oh, you, you made that elf uh, black and I have a problem with that. that, which was one of the things going on around Rings of Power. So uh, I actually, I thought I this was a, a appropriate art to, <laughs> to accompany the article of this is the point. And mm -hmm. this is why it should be a problem. It should upset you. Yeah, stand out. it's just like the mere existence of diversity in these in these movies and TV shows. I have a garbage truck outside. I have my dog. Sorry. It's like the mere existence just gets people really upset. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, I, it's so funny. I like saw those things. I was like, oh, that's great. That's a great, great collage. So it's interesting that yeah, people would be upset I, I, by that. I think it's okay. It's it's great that the garbage is here because uh, that's part of the next article. Uh, but we're not there yet. I just I think sometimes I, I want to be able to be honest about there is a reactive nature, uh, uh, three hundred sixty degrees around some issues sometimes. Where I think that's Joseph, your big point today was, hey, read this article. It was saying some valuable things. It was mm -hmm. a step. I think again, from my words, it's a step in the right direction of actually addressing what's going on versus so many people I know who are at an elevated status in this business, meaning they don't need to have even a Twitter or X account or anything. They don't need to have their IMDb rating 
uh, uh, to worry about. And, and we all three of us have been around those folks when I think they're disconnected from the ground. And a lot of times when this stuff emerges, uh, it's written off as neck beards in their mom's basement. And maybe that's true for some of it, but that's a stereotype that really um, softens the actual effect of what's been going on the last year, five, ten mm-hmm. years. And I thought this article at least addressed it in a, like, yeah, studio executives are aware of this. It's a problem. PR people don't know what to do. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. You know. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, yeah, I was going to, I didn't even think about that. Like, the fact that, there was a Jody Turner Smith uh, interview that came out recently. Somebody posted it on our Discord. I didn't get to read the whole thing, but there was just like a little snippet. And she was just saying how frustrating it is that she kind of felt like nobody was defending them and like saying anything. And it, I think that this article shows like studios don't know what to do. They don't feel like they should amplify that negativity. So they don't really want to address it. So they try and amplify the positive voices, but then it just kind of looks like you're burying your head in the sand. And mm-hmm. so like the whole Ewan McGregor thing, when he came out and spoke, he, d- I think he just did that on his own. I don't mm-hmm. think that, yeah. right. Yeah. I don't think that Lucasfilm put him up, put it up. So I think that there needs to be a clear plan in place from all these studios, but this is all brand new and they're, they're struggling and they're trying to figure out how to go forward with this is what it seems like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, yeah. My thoughts. On, yeah. My thought on that is yes, it is. It's viewed as an old problem. It is. It is the people who complained about Michael Keaton being cast as Batman. We've been here before. Oh, oh these God. nerds. Oh, yes. they, they clutch their comic books <laughs> in their bedrooms and they right. get all upset. But we're, we're and, and, and I think it's, you know, coming out of that, uh, that, that decade of the 80s and, and more, more where, you know, nerd was was not a term you wanted to be associated with. I think it's that that old stink. And, and like there there are without, I, I, there are big studios that they hire firms to watch and monitor and report up to the FBI. They report threats. They do this. This is their job. But even then, when the studios are presented with some of this stuff, they 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 kind of have this, ah, but hey, mm-hmm. that was last season's Rings of Power. People are more okay with it, right? And mm-hmm. and and it's and it's mind boggling. Scott Bromley, a former producer of uh, Star Wars show on YouTube, yeah. put out a great tweet this week saying or one thing you could do is not have 17 layers of executives and lawyers standing between you and the social media teams or PR teams that need to address this. Yes. That that mm. that that yes. really put water on the responses. So, you McGregor, a producer on Kenobi has to just get in his car, thank God, and say something. <laughs> the best right. car video ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a bigger so. discussion. Yeah. This was going to be a small part of the episode, but now I know. <laughs> any I'm final, sorry. Joseph, I don't, I don't want to take any final thoughts away from you before we move on. Anything ah, else? I think my last thought segues into uh, the next one. So I'll say this. Yeah. I think that the, the, the challenge continues to be that like people like Jody Turner Smith are simply being attacked for existing before right. people have seen a second of it. And there are people out there, maybe they've watched a second of Star Wars, maybe they haven't even, and they're just saying a black woman shouldn't be in Star Wars. That's right. garbage and needs to be fought, right? Yeah. But then I think it merges, uh, which is what this article is discussing, is it merges what, which, uh, what, with, uh, with what I think is going on in our larger culture, which is the rise of social media in general, the clear monetization of engagement and negative opinions, I think has taken something that's always been there in the fan community, which is, I love this, so I'm really critical about it. Mm -hmm. I really Mm -hmm. love Star Trek in the 80s. So I really want the next one to be good. And I'm really upset if I think it isn't good. It's taken that sort of natural sort of fan. I love it so much that I'm passionate about it. And and I think sometimes made all of our beloved genres and franchises into a pinata where Mm -hmm. part of the, the, the engagement, a large part of the engagement is just put another piece of meat out there. Hang something so we can hit it. Um, and we've all experienced that in, in conversations in real life where we said, hey, yeah, you got a Star Wars t-shirt. You got a, you like Star Wars? Yeah, the last one sucked. Or yeah, it's all been garbage since blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, the culture and I think sometimes fans are being encouraged and often leading with negativity, leading yes. with talking about what you don't like. So all these sort of like, this article and the next one we're going to talk about are kind of like, how do you how do you make a lot of money and keep all the fans happy? Are they doing a good job with the storytelling? And all of that is so hard to analyze when a huge chunk of the fandom is being encouraged to treat the thing they love like a pinata. That the value mm-hmm. of it is attack it, hit it. 
and then yeah. you say that and then people get concerned They're like what you can't criticize it it's not what yeah. i'm talking about I will crit- we're gonna, about. i'm gonna criticize some stuff roll up your <laughs> sleeves i'm gonna criticize some stuff when we talk about this <laughs> but that's different yep. than the point of entertainment used to be did you have a good time did it make you think did you take a break from your real, real world and now the point of entertainment seems to be yes or no did you like it and who effed up and who needs to be get got over this it's yep. it the the tone of the conversation is being encouraged differently so that we're all encouraged to be really visceral and angry and actual awful racist sexist monstrous garbage is hiding underneath that and combining with that it, mm-hmm. and i think that's the challenge of how do you how do you separate it out and handle it yeah, it gets murky. It gets confusing. So, because sometimes you, you want to have those discussions, uh, and at different times we might run up to it. I ran into it with with the Ahsoka series. The series it just fell completely flat for me, completely flat for me. And I think I pissed off people who were longtime Force Center listeners who did not want to hear that because I think you've misunderstood what I've been trying to do for ten years alongside Joseph and Jennifer. And it gets frustrating because then that all kind of rolls into a ball, and then you can't deal with the individual big issues as the stuff you were saying earlier. One quick thing I, I want to say is that there there seems to be this thing like Ken, you were saying like we're at, uh, on opposite sides. <clears throat> there does seem to be this group of the fan base that feels like they need to win, and so when something fails, like like the acolyte, which you know whatever if you want to say it fails, but that it didn't get a second season, people feel like that's a win. They won. I had random guys coming into <laughs> my YouTube channel on old videos from like. Three years ago, one on like a haunted mansion reaction, who was like, "Ha ha, you suck! You 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 lost. Love to see you crying over the acolyte." And I'm like, "What <laughs> on the haunted mansion uh, reaction? Mm-hmm. Like what? Mm-hmm. Like what are these people talking about? Like?" Th- and then somebody else commented on like uh, an Andor thing, and so I was like, "Why are you commenting on this video for however many years? Like saying that they're gloating and happy that I'm so that I what, what do they say?" Uh, uh, like that I'm crying over it, like basically exaggerating. I was like, where are you coming from? And why are you commenting on a video from three years ago? Like how, <laughs> like, it's just really, really bizarre that these people want to feel like, they're yeah, they're winning. But it's honestly because they feel so powerless in their own lives. I mean, we're going to get into this. I have some thoughts about that going forward, but that's really what it comes down to is that yeah. they just feel they're just sad. They're just sad. It, it's the sportification. It was the great Joseph Scrimshaw that made it clear to me a long time ago that competition isn't bad, but we've kind of uh, turned everything into you win, you lose. And uh, when you had said that, Joseph, it it, it, it was this is a few years ago. It, it 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 really for me was some personal clarity of as a sports fan, as a dude enjoy sports talk, and I watched Miami Dolphins and I got my Yankee hat on. They're playing today, like looking around, and going, "Oh yeah, we didn't we don't learn the lessons of the journey of competitive sports making you better. We only learn the lessons of win, lose, or I'll kick your ass if you, if you get in my way." And and that is been our society for a very long time i would argue <laughs> in mm. this great grand country that i love that i ain't leaving i do love paris uh but uh <laughs> and, and i think Jen, what, what you're speaking of here is uh no they're very competitive too with their 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 food There's, um oh, their food. <laughs> who's got like the sports? longest baguette yeah that's yeah, always yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know what i mean and jen I, I think you're speaking to that too where it's just this does we you you only win you only lose yeah. that's destructive that's destructive in a lot of ways not just Star Wars. yeah yeah, mm-hmm. it, 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 talk, talking about and thinking about that made me appreciate sports even more because, hey, competition is a natural part of us. And it is great to have mm-hmm. an outlet where, like, I had such an amazing time in that Dodgers game and I'm that I went to and I'm so much more invested and it's fun. Like, but then art is a different thing. So why yeah. can't we have this that is about competition and this mm-hmm. that is about enriching our souls? <laughs> well, let's enrich our souls here with a deeper dive into The Hollywood Reporter on Disney and Star Wars. The Hollywood Reporter released an article diving into the 12-year run of Disney Star Wars. I want to say up top, they refer to Disney uh, mostly the, as, opposed, as opposed to this Lucasfilm. They are the same in a, mod- a lot of ways. They're the same on the on the stock ledgers, but uh, there is... There is one studio purchased and working for another. Uh, we'll dive into that as needed. Uh, anyways, uh, they di- took a dive into the 12-year run of Disney Star Wars and uh, asked in a very clickbait-like way, is Disney bad at Star Wars? The normally measured reporter James Hibbard, uh, known for his Game of uh, Game of Thrones insights and coverage and very measured. He has a great book I have over here. Fire cannot uh, – uh, 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 that's the title of it. I can't remember. <laughs> Fire cannot kill a dragon. <laughs> 
<laughs> fire cannot kill a fire can kill a dragon. There it is. Right fire there. cannot kill a dragon. Fire, fire. James Hibbert. But oh, no. he he's known for it, and it's very measured and had very insightful look on hey, season six, here's some things the producers wish they'd done better. Wonderful work. Um, so he was the primary author. And and uh after starting with what I will say for me was a hackles raising swipe of the quality of Star Wars and what we allegedly quote accept as fans, the article becomes somewhat of a Surface level, I don't mean that an insult, but it's just a surface level look that is actually more reason than the title would suggest. We might have thoughts on that. So we're going to go anywhere we want, but we got some questions to get us through. We're going to dive in. The central question, and this is a quote from the article, is Disney kind of bad at Star Wars? Or is this a case where a very high bar for success combined with a passionate fandom's gripes uh, tend to obscure what is otherwise a hugely popular and lucrative franchise? So I'll start here. Uh, Jennifer, is this the correct question? What, what was the bar for what is considered uh, success for Star Wars always going to be too high? Uh, and how high do we want it as fans? I think it's, this is where I, I was really thinking about this this morning. And I feel like what happened with with where the fan base was prior to Disney is we you know, a lot of the fans have tied their identities, myself included, to Star Wars. And, there, and Star Wars for me was like a haven of welcoming a lot of us outsiders, people who didn't feel like we belonged. And at its best, Star Wars welcomed us, right? And we, we found community here. At its worst, people tied their identity so much to it that any deviation for example, by casting, having Ray be the center of the sequel trilogy, a young woman having Finn, a young black man, felt like it was going in a direction where people, a certain group of young white men felt like they were being uh, not heard or left behind. And it did not feel like their Star Wars because for them, they had really identified with Luke or Anakin or Han or whatever. And now... They were supposed to identify with a young female character because they they felt like it was any, and this is what's been happening with Disney Star Wars is that they have had variety, which is wonderful, which is why they have had some successes, but it's also affected a smaller portion of the fan base that feels like they're being emasculated and Star Wars has become feminine. And, and if these people don't feel powerful in their own lives and they already feel like they're being made fun of or whatever, and then you now are like Star Wars now represents this, they're going to, they just feel like that's not what they want to align themselves with. So you have the fan base that is, is moving and making progress. And then you have the fan base that's stuck in the past and want to wants to make America great again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's where this is so complicated. What is success for Star Wars? I don't mm -hmm. know because that, that portion of the fan base, this is a microcosm for our country, right? Either we're going to make progress or we're not. And things are going to be horrible, right? Our, our world is different than when it was in the 1970s and 80s for the better, you know, and and so it's just like it's just really, really frustrating. And I don't know what the answer is. And I kind of feel like Star Wars should just maybe just take a little break. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. I don't know. Take a break from from all of it, not just the films, but from all of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, before it was like people hated George, right? They're like, George messed up Star Wars. And now it's like, well, Disney and Kathleen Kennedy messed up star wars some people just are not happy ever since Man, the original well, trilogy right so uh, right right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i i don't know what the answer is and i don't i think that the bar is is impossibly high and there's almost no way to reach it although the mandalorian did so yeah 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 which we'll sense. discuss yeah mm -hmm. and and then so there's uh joseph uh, bringing in here on your thoughts on the correct question bars high standards yeah i think success. that I, I think the bar is going to be high and it gets uh, immeasurably higher when uh, each generation memory holds how much <laughs> anger there was at the previous generation uh, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. Star Wars uh, storytelling, which I think, yes, I, I get by the time it, 2012 and, and Disney is buying Star Wars. Star Wars is a legendary, amazing uh, property, right? But yeah. but those of us who, who lived through it remember the, the uh, you know, Ewok Fury and the Jar Jar Fury and uh, endless uh, Furies. Uh, like I said, growing up 80s with the Star Trek, I, I, I remember thinking when I was about 12, like, if you love Star Trek this much and movies come out every two or three years, how can you afford to hate everyone? <laughs> yeah. You love yeah. it. 
Um, so one, one, one starting point thought is this sort of like uh, our fans just, you know, accepting anything. Mm-hmm. That, that one's always a, a, a hard one uh, for me because when, when did we become like arbiters? When, when did we become a council? Like we're we're not the like EPA <laughs> where we need to regulate. Is this passing standards? Mm-hmm. Gavel. We we do that all the time with with our money and with our time and with our social engagement. We're always being arbiters, um, and we don't need that that sort of argument of fans will just accept anything because it's Star Wars. Like, yeah, you know what? If you know a mom who works a job and has two kids and has loved Star Wars her whole life, and when she gets home at the end of the day. She doesn't want to do a deep dive on the themes like we do. She wants to watch some, you know, lightsabers <laughs> and adventure. And she's like, that made me happy and I enjoyed it. She can damn well like it because it's Star Wars. Mm-hmm. I think we need to take a big, deep breath, a big step back and leave room for fans like ourselves who are very invested in hardcore and leave people room for people who just want to be entertained and mm-hmm. and. You know, maybe they watch a particular episode and it lands with them and it makes their day better or it makes them think about their life differently. To me, that's the that's that's the holy metric of is it good? Mm-hmm. You did you enjoy it? Did it make you think? Do you want to watch it again? Did, did you buy a t-shirt and it makes you happy on an otherwise horrible day because you're wearing a t-shirt with your Grogu on it? Great, it's good. That to me is like the ideal of what is good. But then this 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 article is really getting into the the show business, the the mm-hmm. quality mm-hmm. of the storytelling, the audience response. So I think also, you know, all of our social media uh, battles devolve into this, yeah, gaveling in whether it was good or bad. Uh, did they win or lose? Like they're playing, playing a baseball game. Mm-hmm. To me, the actual metrics are, and I will be fast on this, financial. How much money is it making? It's a business. Did it make money? Uh, for, for this question, yes, they bought it for $4 billion and they've made $12 billion. Great. Nailed it. Done. Mm. Moving on. (laughs) Critical. Is it critically acclaimed upon release? Uh, do, do fans generally like it? You got to deal with everything we're talking about with the, the bad faith, uh, uh, you know, actors within that, but is it generally critically acclaimed upon release? And Disney, like all other storytelling is up and down on this, um, Arguably, for the critical reception of Star Wars, I would say it's substantially more consistent than when George Lucas owned it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Substantially. Mm-hmm. The, the prequels were despised, even though they made money. Um, so there's mm-hmm. financial, there's critical in the moment, and then there's legacy. What are its legs? Is it reappraised? Does it, even though everybody agrees it was bad and it didn't make money, does it somehow live on in the cultural zeitgeist where everybody's talking about it and there are posters of it at the record store and there are t-shirts and everybody knows that reference. Um, uh, or, or even like it, it gets reevaluated years later and now it's beloved and, and it gets memory hold that everybody, anybody ever hated it. I think for some parts of Disney star Wars, it's too early to tell on the legacy metric, but I think for a lot of them, they're already being reappraised and, and we know from history that the sequel trilogies are, are going to be repraised when the when the generation who grew up with them is like, what are you ancient millennials talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you yelling at me about an interview that Ryan Johnson gave? I didn't I didn't watch that interview when I was six. I watched yeah. Ray and Finn kick ass, mm-hmm. and I've loved mm-hmm. it since I was six. We know that's coming because history tells us it's coming. So for me, mm-hmm. financial. Critical legacy. There are other metrics you can come up with, but those are the metrics to just like actually try to answer this question rather than an utterly subjective baseball game. Was it good? Was it bad for every Star Wars story? Yeah, I agree with that. That's why my my hackles were quite raised when I read the beginning of that or had the beginning actually read to me on another show. I got really upset uh. Uh, because um, – at the end of the day, it's always subjective. It's always going to be. This is this is art, and an artist is going to m- make a decision and put something out. Uh, and even if that's through a corporation's uh, lens, and uh, we do get to decide individually. Individually, I'm such a fan of music. All two of all two of us, all three of us. I was going to say the other you, you two. And I'm here as well. Uh, we all love music. We have conversations every once in a while. We break out on Force Center or other center into conversations about the music that we love. 
Uh, Joseph, you're a Sinatra fan. I, I know there's people who hate Sinatra. Oh, that yes. does not mean he has failed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, he, he passes all three of these tests, financial, yeah, critical, and legacy. Fast. Just fine. Just fine. Mm-hmm. fine. And, and so that's part of the frustration. Uh, uh, in, in, but in terms of asking myself the own uh, the question, is this the correct question? Yeah, I, I think it's fair. There's a, this is a business-minded article, and I think one of the – um, I, I at this point might call it mostly negative, but one of the byproducts uh, of uh, 10 plus years of uh, pop culture discussion in digital media at a higher level when it, was, it wasn't just tweets and podcasts and, and corners or, you know, Rebel Force Radio was the only thing. We, we, we People are live every week. People are live on their phones. This is now a cottage industry. I, th- I think uh, the paying too much attention to the business for people that 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 don't know, going to the the baseball side of it, there's a lot of stats. There's there's new age stats. There's new gen stats that measure things scientifically. It's insane. So mm. barrel rate on a on a ball. How many with your baseball bat? How many times do you barrel up the baseball? And I asked one of my friends who played in Major League Baseball. I don't know if I, I like these stats. He said these new these stats are great for us. You and your fantasy baseball fans should not give a bleep about them. They don't mean anything to you. Watch the game. He said, for us, yeah, I can measure down to the centimeter how I want to swing my bat. I need that. Spin rate on baseball. That that's, doesn't matter to you, but now we feel it, though, it matters. And I think there's some uh, correlation to some of the film stuff of how it gets made, who's off, who's angry on set, who gets fired. So I think that is uh, jumbled in here. But I do think this is a correct question. And how high do I want the standard for Star Wars? I'm going to be very high because of all the metrics you've come up with, Joseph, all wonderful and all correct. Legacy is the most important to me, right? Um, uh, legacy of what it makes you feel, what it makes inspiring the younger generation. When I sit there, I want to feel inspired. You're talking about, uh, uh, you know, the mom going home uh, to, to to the family and just wants to sit down and watch a Star War. I call those uh, the, I call those the Target shirt people, and I have Target <laughs> shirts too. You go to you go to Target, you buy some milk, you, you swing through the toy aisle, uh, and then you go to the clothes and you go, oh, a Millennium Falcon shirt. Yeah, mm-hmm. ninety two thousand people are wearing that any <laughs> any given day. But it doesn't not it doesn't mean you're not a Star Wars fan. It doesn't mean you have to go get the vintage shirt or you have to go. You know, you all should order Brian Ward shirts. But you know what I mean? Like that's that's a Star Wars fan, and that's the measure of success. Uh, Star Wars is Coke, Pepsi. It is, uh, 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 you know, Rolling Stones. It is a brand. And it's that's part of the metric is the legacy is still still going strong. And is it still making money? Yeah, clearly it is. Um, so all that yeah. rolled into one there. Yeah, no, and I think this 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 article is vital and important. This conversation is is vital and important because the financial success has real world impacts. If the Acolyte had done great in the ratings, we'd be living in a different world. The, the, the business and the numbers are important um Mm. but the legacy is what lasts i don't know how other people do it but like if i watch an old movie that i maybe haven't even like heard of that much Mm -hmm. uh, i'll watch it and i'll decide whether i fall in love or not and then right before i go to sleep i'll look on wikipedia and go ah it made no money and people hated it huh anyway (laughs) i love it that's how it's gonna live on right yeah yeah Mm. yeah Mm. 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 well Trying to move on here. We're going to do four four hours on each question here because it's a spot. <laughs> thing. But but again, I, I want to say that again. This article, I, remember, I I was ready to just mf it all the way through. We're still trying to be clean here in Force Center after all these years. We used to swear earlier on in the show, um, but it, it's just a, it was a it was almost like a boring beat by beat, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So here we go. The Disney era has produced five Star Wars films so far. Far, uh, they have all been they have all made money, but only two have been without BTS drama, unless at least unless you're counting Han Solo, Harrison Ford, and his broken ankle. We still don't know what really happened with that. The article <laughs> highlights that the earnings have trended downward, and that the film set of Star Wars has a chaotic feeling with the BTS changes, struggles, and a bevy of projects announced or rumored and uh, were never made. The point is uh, made that this is uh, abnormal for the famously meticulous studio, Disney, not necessarily Lucasfilm, but one could be charitable, this is kind of what the article puts out there, and say that they, uh, they being Disney or Lucasfilm, are correct to get it right because it's Star Wars. So, uh, Joseph, the film side has mm-hmm. been chaotic at times. Mm-hmm. Um, 12 years on, what do we feel has worked on the film side for you? And and feel for, as always, any of these questions, Joseph Jennifer, I put them, I was watching football when I put them together yesterday, so go wherever you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to I'll try to uh, answer your question and, and, and answer the positive, because the positive and the negative are kind of all jumbled together, but I know we're going to talk about the negative as well. Uh, I think what has worked in, in on the film side, mm-hmm. the films 
for me. <laughs> I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, like I, I, I think that uh, some of the creative choices that cause chaos are not behind the scenes. Chaos are not great. And mm, talk mm -hmm. about the solo box office and all that. But in terms of that legacy question, I think the films all really stand up. I don't need to like hold my nose and go, well, I'm a Star Wars fan and this is all I get. So I guess I'll like it. <laughs> like, yeah, I enjoy all of these films. I have my little, you know, uh, critiques uh, like everybody else, but I think they'll stand the test of time. Solo in particular that uh, because it's been overlooked, I think will be mm -hmm. really reappraised. I think the entire sequel trilogy, when it is separated from behind the scenes drama, holds together much, much better than the majority of people feel. In my opinion, I think there is some zigging and zagging between The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker where we, where we get a what feels pretty definitive that Rey is from nowhere and then we get Palpatine pulled back into it. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, that is no worse or better than the original trilogy, which I grew up through. Uh, Luke and Leia kiss twice, then their siblings. People would lose their damn minds in the internet sphere. And they did lose their minds mm. just in person <laughs> mm -hmm. back in the eighties. Han got frozen in carbonite. And if you knew the behind the scenes story is because maybe we're afraid that Harrison doesn't come back. So we just kind of throw Lando in there who is basically <laughs> just a Han in case Harrison Ford doesn't come back. Right. Car people would lose their minds. Han got frozen, all that melodrama. And then the beginning of the movie is that like, boop, he's out. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then in the third film, he doesn't even fly the Millennium Falcon himself. And he's all moony eyed over Princess Leia. These were real talking points in mm -hmm. the 80s about the tonal shifts in the, in the slight zigs and zags in the uh, original trilogy. And there were people who were angry about them, but mm -hmm. the anger wasn't monetized the way it mm -hmm. is today. So I feel like uh, um, that, that was a little divergence into maybe some negativity. Mm -mm. But I, I, I really, truly think I get I get it was a, it was a big turn. We got two answers for where Ray is from. And I understand that's I think that is as jarring as are, are Luke and Leia going to hook up. No, they're siblings. It's jarring. Yeah. Um, but I think that they're really well made films. And if you just concentrate on who are the characters, what do they want? What do they need? What they're challenged by? Those films hang together beautifully and are just a beautiful essay on on dealing with nostalgia in the past. Mm -hmm. I think the films are all great. Rogue One. Uh, is is to me rogue one is clunky but still somehow also absolutely amazing and i love it every time i watch it so mm -hmm. the films are the success of the films to me uh, i agree with that there jen uh what is uh what has worked for you on the film side i just i really try to tune out the noise and just focus on each film there's something i love about it right even if it doesn't totally land with me there's elements like beast on like or or seeing Doc, dr evison and ponda baba for that small moment right just just so many little things that i can i can just relish and that make me appreciate each film uh mm -hmm. and i think that it's been a success and the funny thing about time is as you guys are saying like the, the what are the legacy of these films and how will people revisit them later on i think a nightmare for christmas and when that came out i don't know if it was a box office hit per se mm -hmm. i don't think so right because i remember like i was obsessed with it i saw it in theaters walked out and went, god i was horrible Really? <laughs> like, what, what? And I, yeah, I, yeah. But the, to your point, like it wasn't. It was people, not. You know, it, it was not what it is now. No, and office I remember, space was not what it, it is. Was now. not right. And it's no. so funny to me. Then, like, I, I remember I like had like one pencil before for Nightmare Before Christmas because there was no merch, and then yeah. one day. Merch for Nightmare Before Christmas was everywhere. Office space was memed to death. And I was like, mm -hmm, these mm -hmm. movies, which were like not really well, you know, well received now are like pop culture phenomenons. And so time is funny and people may look back on Solo and be like, that was the greatest Star Wars ever. Right. So I don't know. I just have to enjoy what I enjoy. And, you know, there's some things that didn't quite work for me, but that's okay. We get yeah. Star Wars. There was a time when there was no Star Wars, and so I don't know. I, I, I'll I'll check it out. Why not? Why not? Yeah. I guess I'm one of those fans that the, that that person is saying. I mean, <laughs> I <laughs> no, am that but, person. But see, the 
and sorry if I cut you off, but one of the things that's worked for me when I'm discussing, Joseph, you touch on it, and Jen, Jennifer, you just you touch on it too. The, the article has a great moment where clearly the author, James Hibbard, doesn't like Rise of Skywalker. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not abnormal. A lot of people don't like that film who are, uh, Jen, I know it's not your favorite Star Wars films. It's yeah. not, Alex uh, Damon has said it's not his favorite. It, it is my favorite Star Wars film to watch right now. It doesn't mean it's my favorite mm -hmm. Star Wars film. It's my favorite film to watch. And the article has a, hey, for all, uh, all the problems with it, at least has one of the best scenes in the canon of all Star Wars, which is Han and, and, and Kylo uh, <gasps> Ren and Han uh, Kylo becoming Ben in this moment. It, it's one, of, and, and he praises the moment. That's always been what I've loved about uh, Star Wars. That's why, that's why you know, I wrote a damn book on it, uh, because you know, the sonic depth charge sound of, 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 of uh, Jango's ship in Attack of Clones probably kept me a Star Wars fan when I was ready <laughs> to ditch it. Right? Because it was like, oh, I didn't like that film. And my friends tell me it sucks. And I think it sucks too. Oh, but that was really cool. That's, that was, that was, that sound, that greatest Star Wars sound ever. Like, and, and that kept me attached to it. And these films, for all the problems that we are aware of and some that we aren't aware of, uh, still deliver these wonderful moments that have inspired uh, the younger generations behind it. Uh, that have reached big. Uh, I remember my early review of Rise of Sky Skywalker was, it was pretty bonkers, had a lot of bonkers stuff in it that I don't know if even on paper I would have wanted in my Star Wars, but I'm glad I got it in that. And I'm glad I got in this kind of crazy, uneven film. Uh, and, and that was my take on it uh, coming out of the first viewing. Um, and yeah, I think time does change things, but I think they've delivered on that end. I, I, I think moments get revisited. It, it, you mentioned the solo th thing. This, this article talks about Rogue One kind of getting... Uh, um, a little benefit of time and people loving it more. And it, it is uneven. That second act is to me, you know, a little uneven for me to, to say, to say it uh, politely. And it says solo hasn't gotten that. I, 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 I think that's true. I just had a conversation two weeks ago to party with someone who, who, who voiced pretty well what they felt they would have wanted out of the film. Uh, they're also a very creative person. And I trust their, their instincts. And I, yeah, that was great, but we didn't get that. We got this. And what do you take from that? And I do think I've had so many friends say, oh, I ended up watching that two years later. I liked it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't watch it because I was told it was bad. And right. I think the films, the film side has overcome that. The expectations are immense. They cannot be even fully measured. Uh, and I think they've succeeded in the face of, uh, Huge, huge uh, expectations from many, many, many fans for many, many decades. Yeah. Mm, mm, Can awesome. I mention one thing from the business side that's in this article? Yeah, please. Uh, and it's a thing I've heard other people in my real life say to me and, and other pundits say, um, he's talking about the, yeah, yeah, the films have made a bonkers amount of money that other franchises would <laughs> absolutely kill for. Yeah. But, oh, they Solo had the release the date problem we'll talk about, and then Rise of Skywalker did not. Did not do as well. It only made a billion dollars <laughs> instead of mm. two or 1.3. Right. Uh, yeah. it, it says, when the third entry in your trilogy launching a new franchise sells half as many tickets as the first, you probably made a wrong turn somewhere. And mm. I, I understand that a lot of people have legitimate things that they legitimately don't like about Rise of Skywalker. It's a, it's a mixed critical reaction at best to a negative critical reaction. I love the film and I get that and I accept that. But in terms of looking at it from a business perspective, this criticism of it making less money always bothers me because it's not just about the rise of Skywalker. It's about mixed reception to last Jedi. And most importantly, it's about the force awakens was a one in a million cultural moment. It wasn't just star Wars is back. It's the impossible has happened. The big three are back. Han, Luke and Leia are back. When Han solo says, Chewy, we're home. It was a metatextual moment that only time and happenstance can create. It wasn't just, it didn't make $2 billion because The Force Awakens was a good film. It made $2 billion because it's an impossible to repeat cultural metatextual moment. So I think comparing the other films to Force Awakens, look at the same thing happened with the that first Jurassic Park movie, that it was a we uh, one generation saying we can't believe this is happening this is coming back and it didn't live up to it continually so mm -hmm. it, it bothers me on a business perspective to be like yep rise of skywalker should have made more money more money and it would have if last jedi and rise of skywalker were both better received across the board but to compare it to force awakens is bonkers math because it's not taking into context what that film was 
not saying it was, and just the natural flow of, of things like that. That's going to happen, right? Yeah, it was a cultural uh, uh, thing. Uh, trust me, if they make Barbie 2, I don't think it's going to make as much money. That's not the way it works. You're going to lose uh, a lot. How many how many times have you launched a podcast and the first episode is great and the second one is okay and the third one, you got to keep going because those are your fans, right? Yeah, uh, and, and Oppenheimer 2 is really going to bomb. Oppenheimer <laughs> not, I didn't mean that as a pun. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> e, wordplay. Yeah. Um, uh, tracking as James Hibbard will tell you, tracking Game of Thrones. Some of, they set like season three or four. They had this amazing run where each week like set the highest mark of TV ever watched by the highest rated version of the show, right? And then there was points where it dropped off. But like you said, it wasn't because of episode six. It was because of episode five, mm -hmm. and word of mouth of episode five was bad, so it hurt episode six of, of certain seasons. I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds on the numbers, but it's just kind of natural flow of it. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't like when the numbers that specifically are used against it. It's barrel rate, spin rate. Not not something that should matter to us. All right. We're coming up. We're, we're, don't worry. We're, the film side, we've got a couple questions here, kids, and then we're going to take a break. On the film side, uh, what does not work for us as fans and fans with some access to behind-the-scenes stories? I'll maybe explain what I feel about that. But, Jennifer, uh, now's your shot. All right? <laughs> now's your shot. What does not yeah. work for you over the last 12 years? <laughs> Yeah, we got thoughts. Uh, loose lips sink starships. I think the problem is that everyone feels like they want to do a share a scoop. Like mm -hmm. there's always mm -hmm. drama behind the scenes when you're making a movie, right, Joseph? Like there's mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always gonna be drama, you know, cast changes, script things, whatever. That's just making a movie. However, in old days past, you didn't have you know some person. Uh, in the parking lot, you know, reporting on what they're seeing on the set. Like you just didn't have like everyday people who could share this information online to millions of people. The trades were just like hard copies that were delivered to studios and casting offices that you would look look to. It wasn't just like now we're getting this all online and they have to drive clicks, right? They have to make the most salacious headlines to get views. And so it's just... I, I don't, the behind the scenes stuff is really kind of, it kind of ruins, <laughs> it ruins the magic of the movies, I think. And people have already made up their mind on whether the film is going to be good or bad without seeing anything, right? Um, and so I think that people are too dialed in. They're just too dialed in or they think they're too dialed in, right? Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, it's not good. It's not good. Like what you're talking about, Ken, with baseball. We don't need to know all that. Just just show me show me the trailer. Show me the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You hear that, Joseph? Yeah. I mean, I think um I, I think one thing that that's coming up in our discussion is also just think me thinking about the way we view things when we were, we were young versus the way we're viewing things now. Mm -hmm. Which is when mm -hmm. when we see when you're six or seven or eight or twenty-eight and you see Star Wars for the first time. You're just seeing a finished object and it just is what it is. When mm -hmm. a new Star Wars comes out, you are looking at, did anybody screw this up? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, as your, mm -hmm. your writer friend at the party said, how would I have done it? Uh, mm -hmm. it you know, with fan fiction, you're not looking mm -hmm. at a set thing. You're not, it, it, imagine the difference between looking out, uh, being on a cliff and looking out at a beautiful vista and going, hey, that river is there and that tree is there and I find it beautiful. Or going, who put that river there? That's dumb. The river should have flowed the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. two different ways to look at things. And, and with all the behind the scenes and being adults and being in love with it, we have so many opinions about what it is. We're not looking at it. We're not accepting it as here's the story before you. It's what should it have been if you don't like it? Who screwed up and how? Who, who made that river flow that dumb direction? Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. Which I realize mm -hmm. rivers mostly flow <laughs> in specific directions. Anyway, uh, so to me, there, part of it is the that that the way we're approaching it is not as a set thing being presented to us, but a malleable thing that could have or should have been different. Mm -hmm. um, for me myself, what hasn't worked, um, I think I, I love Force Awakens, but I think elements of it played it played it too safe. Um, I I love seeing the X wings, and they're great. But yeah, maybe it maybe would have been better to have a bonkers new ship, you know, things like that. And there are moments for me where Force Awakens played it too safe. Um, I think uh, behind the scenes, the solo release timing was was real, real bad. And Uncle Bob admitted it. It was it was an utter, utter uh, train wreck uh, uh, in terms of the uh, release. I think uh, Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, I think they actually hang together 
thematically and character arc really, really well. But I think there is a tonal shift, um, which, which you, you have to be willing to accept. I think Star Wars has lots and lots of ingredients. And one of the big ingredients is a rip roaring, fast moving uh, space adventure, you know, uh, serial problems where, where serial cliffhanger energy, where you jump from one weird problem to the next. And Last Jedi, to its credit, turned the dial way down on that. And Rise of Skywalker, to its credit, turned the dial way up on that. And there is a tonal shift. And that is, isn't even really like a criticism. But just to me, it's like, I think it's one of the reasons that that people, they love one or the other and get cranky with the other. There's there's a tonal thing. And maybe there should have been an effort to, to blend the tones more. So mm -hmm. they didn't kind of, those two films didn't kind of go to extremes in terms of Star Wars. Um mm -hmm. Uh, I think the the volume of behind the scenes changes is obviously not great for business, but I think it produced creatively good films, and I think they're creative good moves. I'm really glad that J.J. Abrams was the one who made uh, Rise of Skywalker and not uh, 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 Colin Trevorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I think they need to stop announcing projects until they're really locked on the business yes. side. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but for me, those are the things that haven't worked. Yeah, no, all excellent stuff. Great with you both here for me. Um, yeah, a lot of it is is I wish there was a yeah better, I would say, like controlling the narrative, but it is, does come down to the news side, and that goes beyond just the film. So I'm trying to focus on just the film side. But yeah, it just seems, look, you're not going to get the truth on a lot of the, the things that have come out. There's probably NDAs and settlements and all those kind of things, but it, it was it, it, it definitely affected uh, people's uh, thoughts going into some of the films. Solo, be, yeah, absolutely. I, I still hear, hear the Lord and Miller conversation, right? Still hear it. Um, and uh, the reason I added this tag of, of uh, we're, we're fans and we're, we're broadcasters and, and entertainers, but we have some access to behind the scenes stories. We, oh, if you've listened to Force Center for over the last 10 years, we always make those little winks and nods and jokes of, oh, we were at this weird party. And uh, we've, all three of us have been in entertainment now collectively for like 75 plus years. <laughs> but I've been in L.A. for 25 years. Jen, you've been out here. Joseph, uh, you're 10 years in, 12 years in or whatever to L.A., but you're also in Minnesota, which is uh, a hotbed of comedy and rock and wrestling and music and, and just creativity. You're around, folks. You're around, folks. And there's people we all know who have worked on the films. They've gone. They've pitched. They've taken meetings. And you hear some things, and it's just crazy some of the stuff that comes out that I don't think needs to be factored in. We could scoop with the best of them if we wanted. I'm not going to get a job mm -hmm. at a at a like a hospital and hide in a parking structure and take pictures of Favreau and, and Filoni on a set. But there's so many things that I just feel that it's how the omelet is made type of metaphor, mm. and a lot of it needs to be parsed out. Like I, I, I after Dial of Destiny, I, I I heard from a friend who was sitting with a f two or three friends at at her house, going, "Yeah, they just came from the premiere. They hated it." I was like, "I love Dial of Destiny," and they're, uh, they're I'm sorry, the reasons they gave all all boiled down to they don't like Big Jim Mangold. End of discussion. Um. Probably because they wish they were the ones who made the film. And that stuff filters out and starts poisoning the well of what is actually in the film. I mean, again, you may not like it. I'm not asking you to like mm -hmm. Battle of Destiny. I just, it's, it's, I, I love that the, the Indiana Jones film that it is. I love uh, what's going on because I'm engaging with what's there and I'm finding what's there for me. And I do think that that control the narrative, it's just in, in this age, Disney and Lucasfilm being understandably closed off to uh the walls right we're, we're over here we're it's wonka's factory we're making magic we bought it from george lucas but we're still making the magic and then there's a lot of people at the wall going i heard this i heard this what do you think about this you're announcing this film then you got a director coming out of the factory going i guess what i'm gonna make a film and oh, and, and and that that silence as i as a, 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 has has for me again like i said poisoned the well and some of the enjoyment where i've got friends who are like I didn't see Solo. I don't know that whole thing with uh, Lord Miller. Really? Did you hear some of the stories that I've heard about what they did on set? Because I don't know. It seems like a pretty good decision. Uh, oh, I don't know. I just heard. That's what I heard. So I don't I didn't watch that movie. And I just think I wish going back 12 years on the film side because we're still dealing with it. There, there. I don't know how you want to, you, you, again, there's things you can't say, but you know, will the Ray movie get made is a real fair question. We talked about the Ray movie and Daisy Ridley's comments last week. We did our Four Center deep dive, deep dive, but there was people in the YouTube comments, eh, film's never going to get made. They might not be wrong, uh, just because it's been so chaotic. So they got to right the ship, they got to calm the waters, and I think get ahead of some of the stories, not just rumors, not just breaks and in, 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 in plot scoops and everything, but just be a little, seem to be a little bit more in control. Like I think Marvel <laughs> is at times, like Beyonce. 
They got to be like Beyonce. <laughs> Nobody we knows all, what she's up to. Right? Yeah. And then she just like drops an album. That's what Lucasfilm and Disney need to do. Mm. Just, I mean, really? Yeah, and then it's everyone's going to be like, yes, wow, Ooh. Star Wars is happening. We didn't know this was coming. <laughs> right? Could Get be. ahead of it. It could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Final round of this. Final question. I knew this was going to be long. All right. Uh, how will we measure success for Star Wars films once the next era begins with, most likely at this point, The Mandalorian and Grogu? Uh, Jen, what's the measure of success going forward? We talk a lot of behind the scenes stuff, about higher walls around the studio, uh, about chasing out of people, people out of parking structures, taking set pictures. Uh, PR, what, what, what's your level of success going forward? It's got to be a huge hit. Otherwise, people yeah. will say it's a failure. Like, it has to be a mega success and i think it will be i do i think it's going to appeal to a wide audience i think the word of mouth is going to be good i think families are going to go uh the merch is going to be great <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that they're going to be all right um at least that's my hope because if it's not a smash then it, there's going to be all the think pieces that that star wars is dead mm -hmm. there we go there we go Saturday Night Live is dead 50 years into its run. Um, <laughs> no, but Jed, I, I agree with you there. I, I do believe this has to be a, a home run. And Joseph, some of the metrics you brought up, I think all three metrics kind of need to work here. We're, legacy you won't know until mm -hmm. uh, down the line, but it's got to have that feel. Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, I, 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 I'm so excited for a potential Ray movie. It's still, uh, I believe that's going to happen. I still want that. I, I, I'm excited about Big Jam Mangold and his view of the, the Dawn of the Jedi. Filoni's film, uh, I'm waiting to see. I'm definitely excited, definitely interested to see his big take on it. But there's a lot of pieces that got to come together for my anticipation to build to a higher level. But this kind of out of left field, we'll talk about taking a show and turn it into a movie. There's some thoughts the article has on it. But this out of left field kind of uh, popular decision, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Pivoting to what might be working as, as a stand-up comic, I get to the audience tells me every night that even though I have this wonderful piece of art, that this bit has a lot of things, a lot of things I want to say. If that night they just want to hear poop jokes, guess what I gotta do? And I'm not saying this movie's a poop joke, but I'm just saying <laughs> you have to read yeah. the audience. Yeah, Grogu Mandalorian, might be there for you. He yeah. might be. Yeah. Might be. But you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Where like, I and then I have to retool. I'm not, this doesn't, doesn't mean I'm going to take my artsy, uh, purposeful, poignant comedy bit and throw it out the window. I got to retool it if it's not working and there, and, 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 and things in the, there's a chaotic feel that's not incorrect about the Star Wars movies. It's not incorrect to have that, like, what is going on over there? Um, this to me needs to, it's a good decision. You've liked these characters, the marketing, the, 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 the Grogu plush doll soul tells us that there's a, there's a want for these characters. Let's take it to the big screen. I think it's going to be successful, but uh, it does have to hit some of those metrics early on. Joseph, take us home mm -hmm. on that one. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the go going for some the the metrics we talked about, I mean, l legacy we have to wait on, but just starting with the personal. Like, for me, mm -hmm. what does it need to do for me to uh, enjoy it? Uh, as a story, I want it to feel like a complete meal. It'll obviously be building on the show and building on the lore, but mm -hmm. I want it to balance, you know, the past and, and, and the future and have it be something that feels new and big and exciting. And I want it to be something that's super, uh, that, that's got uh, uh, very enjoyable for hardcore audiences who have spent a long time and are wondering where Mando and Grogu are on their emotional journey. But I also just want it to be accessible to everyone. I want it to bring be able to bring my dad, who hasn't watched anything since the original trilogy 30 years ago, uh, to it. And I think that was the power of the first season of The Mandalorian. There was a ton to nerd out about if you were a hardcore fan. And it made sense if you were a hardcore fan. Mm -hmm. But it was still just like, it's a it's an emotional story of, you know, uh, a, a hard edged bounty hunter becoming a father to this strange lovable adorable creature it is it was a very accessible store uh, uh story so for me i just i just need it to be a successful story that feels like yeah. a meal onto itself in terms of uh 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 the critical analysis i think you know yeah i wanted to get good reviews i want fans to like it uh, for me you know does it feel like a cultural moment does it mm. feel like the winter christmas of mando and grogu and that's what you talk to your family about and mm -hmm. yeah okay they ripped off his thigh armor and gave him an orange piece so they could sell new action figures and you kind of make fun of it. But 
everybody also mm-hmm. wants orange thigh Mando, and it's kind of fun. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it bleeping safe mm-hmm. to put a post on social media of like, Oof. I really love orange thigh Mando, or is it just going to be like, it's not worth it because I'm going to have 800 mm-hmm. chuds in my comments telling mm-hmm. me that I'm a, you know, whatever bullshit. Uh, uh, anyway. Mm-hmm. Is it safe to like it? C- can I just say I enjoyed this without it ruining my bleeping day? And I'm an old white guy. <laughs> <laughs> and my bar for having my day ruined is nowhere near as bad as other people's. Is yeah. that so much to ask? Can I say I liked a thing mm-hmm. without it having to take two hours out of my day? And maybe I can't finish writing that script because I said I liked Orange Thigh Mando. <laughs> that, maybe that's a personal bar. I think I disappeared into some rabbit holes there. Final thought on the financial. I think Star Wars, Lucasfilm, Disney, Marvel, in many aspects of the industry, have to find a way to redefine the box office. It is not the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. Barbie and Oppenheimer are great films. Those artists both did a great job. There was a battle about not moving off the date, and that was a sort of a cultural moment that nobody can control. I think they both would have done very well without it, but that Barbenheimer mania enhanced it and made it a special event and made it a you know, metatextual event. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't control those things. Um, is there any way, and I don't have the answer to this, but I think it's the question. Is there any way that Mando and Grogu could cost 300 million and make 500 million, make a mm. like $200 million and have everybody go, cool. It was a fun star Wars movie. I enjoyed it. Or is Every Star Wars movie ever is every Marvel movie ever going to be weighed against the cultural phenomenon of a different era. Mm-hmm. Every Star Wars movie cannot be a new hope, the Phantom Menace or the Force Awakens. And I understand it's really easy and profitable for lots of us to whack them if they mm-hmm. didn't make that money. Mm-hmm. But that's not a sustainable way to tell these stories. They can't all be giant hits. Why can't mm-hmm. they just make a profit and be enjoyable and, and be able to have a way to have that conversation, not be exactly what you said, Jen, of it's gotta be a monster hit or everyone will dogpile on it. It's like, how, how do we move beyond that? Mm. Yeah. 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 I I think that the, the conversations every week of weekend about opening box offices, uh, I, I, I never understood why it's too exciting. I was, had a job where I had a report on it and and got laid off from the job because I didn't, I care about stuff like that or the movies what's going on it's just I haven't seen Joker 2 probably never will but like what is it I haven't heard one person say what it is saying hmm. a couple people I should say I've seen some posts but here's what the movie's saying I'm not saying the movie that means it's good I'm just like it's all about it bombed or did this or they did or now the, now we're reading Gaga and Joaquin Phoenix's lips at a, at a premiere like that's the conversation versus what is the film saying and can it be judged on that and, and and in that case, maybe it's judged poorly for a good reason. I don't know. But I'm just saying, <laughs> to your point here, yeah, yeah. Can it just do – can it just exist? Because you're, you're, you're up against uh, three giant films, like you said, New Hope, Phantom Menace, and The Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll find out soon enough when the film finally makes its way to theaters. We're going to take a quick break. You know what? I was looking at the time. We've had longer first halves of the podcast. <laughs> We're just getting warmed up. We're going to take a break. Uh <laughs> We come back right after this. This is Force Center. Uh, I'm Ken. That's Joseph. This is Jennifer. We're in our virtual studio. And we're continuing to take a look inside the Hollywood Reporter article titled, Is Disney Bad at Star Wars? We should also maybe address that uh, film journalism, uh, legit film journalism, has gotten to the point where to compete, it has to do this, by the way. Yeah. It has to do this. Um, looking at the TV side, the article uh, takes the same surface level look at the Disney Plus show era from 2019 on. It goes through each show, highlighting both the good and the bad. Budget and watch time come up a lot. Those are metrics important to studios. Kenobi should be considered success by the measure of watch time. Andor, as has been mentioned before in other places, is actually on the low end of watch time. It gets a bump for its finale, but everyone's going to get a bump for the finale. Uh, and yes, we'll get to the Acolyte had lower watch times. I, 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 you could say it's the show. You could also say it's air. We can discuss it as it comes up. 
But anyways, how much, I guess this is repeating a little bit what we're talking about on the movie side, but how much do we pay attention to pay attention to that? Especially with what I, decades of TV view and experience between us three, where numbers don't always relate to our personal view of good TV, all right? Like, I didn't watch a lot of, thank God, it's Friday programming, all right? I didn't watch that. I watched Get a Life on Fox, which had horrible, horrible, horrible <laughs> numbers. It was canceled, and it's still one of the best comedies oh of all time. Nathan Hamill agrees with me. All right, Jen, where do you go with this? Oh, it's a great show. Um, you know, it's interesting because I know what I like, and sometimes I kind of look around the room and see what the numbers are. And so it's kind of sure. funny to me that everyone points to Andor, 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 mm -hmm. as Andor. being like, this is Andor. what Star Wars, Andor, is this is what Star Wars should be. <laughs> and yet the numbers were not as high as people are kind of touting it to be. Um mm -hmm. And there's like Ahsoka for me didn't really land, but it did all right with the numbers. So I can't really, I personally don't judge the numbers as anything, especially because there are other factors like with the acolyte and those numbers, I believe were, I don't want to say manipulated, but like if you're slamming the show and review bombing it, there's going to be a lot of people who just aren't going to tune in because that's what they've seen it. and heard, which is what yep. we've talked about. Right. So yep. Uh, I, yeah. I try to tune out the tune out that noise and focus on the content, focus on the stories and what resonates with me. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. So just let you dive in here. Yeah. It, look, I, watch time, run time and, and views. Like, I, I, I'm not going to say I don't pay attention to them. Um, a, after Game of Thrones came to what many would say a crashing end, it's still like the most watched show on HBO's apps, whatever wow. the apps are, they've changed them 15 times. Mm -hmm. uh, it still has the conversation. Uh, it, 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 our, our buddy Ken Plume was like, you, you know, like Game of Thrones TikTok, not House of the Dragon, but like Game of Thrones TikTok is still surging right now. It's still a thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there is some value in, in, in watch times, Joseph, but how much do we pay attention? What, how do you, how do you uh, rate all this as a Kenobi fan? This is yeah. I mean, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, as a Kenobi fan, I feel like well, what is actually the, problem uh yes. if it did really yes. well on the numbers and critically it got pretty good reviews and i know some fans have really really dislike it and all that but that's just always mm -hmm. going to be the way so i guess th the best part of this article was like hey there really shouldn't be a kenobi season two damn it mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you and Ewan, ewan's out there fighting for it at you the say, los yeah. angeles comic-con oh anyway, my gosh uh you know i think I, I feel the same way where i feel like you know it, it, the the art is the most important thing. When I was very young and I watched Sam in in Diane uh, Diane leave Cheers uh, for mm. the first time at the end of season five and insist that to Sam that she'll be back in 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 yeah. six months and he whispers six. to her after she leaves the door, "Have a good life." My mm. little heart was broken and I learned something mm. about life and I did not turn to my dad and go, "What were the Nielsen's?" Like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Art is what I, I, remember. I heard John Madden was going to play coach. <laughs> they should have co ca cast John Madden. Uh, yeah. Oh uh, the numbers start to matter when you get older and you realize that they are tied to the continuation of the to thing the you love. Yeah. Right. And I, I started to care a lot about numbers when Twin Peaks blew my mind, changed my life, helped mm. me greatly become the the person mm. that i did made me feel less frankly alone that that show was huge to me and it it started as a phenomenon and then it went up and down and i remember listening to radio shows because the actor russ tamlin was going to be on and he was going to give you the inside baseball about whether or not it was going to mm. continue and I, I was invested then because it meant the continuation of a thing i loved mm. and i think that's that's where numbers matter and like the, those twin peaks feelings are other other people are feeling about the acolyte. The numbers matter because a thing you love may or may not continue. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. the numbers matter to me. But just kind of looking at this at analysis of, okay, so the breakdown in this article is that there have been multiple Star Wars shows and some of them did really well in numbers and others did really well in the critical response. <laughs> and my general question is, what's the problem? That's... Mm -hmm television right <sighs> that, you know 30 rock didn't do well in the ratings ever but it won ever. awards left and in, in right you know mm -hmm. it, it, anyway. that's the development uh, i mean that's the development yeah <sighs> it, so, so i think the, the things that affect me the most are uh the streaming shows especially tied to franchises are doing something unprecedented big budget genre storytelling uh we got marvel doing it we've got star wars doing it doctor who is going to wade into it that lord of the rings mm -hmm. is is doing it um 
Uh, and I think Marvel and Star Wars did stumble by doing too much. I agree with that, by putting mm -hmm. too much out of the gate. And I think the biggest thing that hasn't worked for me with the television series, and this goes for Star Wars and Marvel, is because of the way they're making them, just taking too long for narratives to continue. If they, mm -hmm. if the streamers had followed more traditional television models, mm -hmm. it made people go, hey, I really liked Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I wonder what's going to happen next. Well, wait five to eight years. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love, Shang-Chi was in the movies, but he's like, hey, what if he teamed up with so-and-so? Well, wait, an unknown number of years. Um, I, I, I enjoyed Ahsoka more than both of you. I had, I had problems with it. It was probably my most challenging of all the Star Wars shows, but I think I still enjoyed it more than, than both of you. But even that one feels like, okay, I didn't get as much story as I wanted in that. All these drips and drabs of places we're going and how long am I going to have to wait for that season? I think that's the, the biggest downside is we're losing more casual audience loyalty. We're even losing hardcore fan loyalty for waiting an incredibly long time to everywhere from two, one to two to three to maybe never years mm -hmm. to be paid off on our investment. I think that's the biggest problem with the streaming television right now. I agree with that. And, and, and even to one of your other points of, yeah, the numbers are important. I, I do think this stuff is fascinating because we've all, you know, uh, you know, I'm a Freaks and Geeks fan. That's the first mm. in 1999. How, how could you cancel that show? All right, that's gone. I'm going to fall in love with the rest of development. How could you cancel that show? Oh, no one watched it. Like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> and there's there's big factors to it. That, you know, Jen, you bring up Acolyte. I, I, yeah, the numbers were down. The budget was high. I think it is uh, uh, on, on some levels a, a pragmatic business decision, but there's other factors because I've had those conversations as you've had, Jed, of I didn't watch the show. Why? Well, yeah, I heard, I heard the tomato meter was low. Ah, okay. Why? Why was it tomato? Let's go mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. Let's go into that. So there's those bigger conversations that maybe it's not about today. It's about this article. Um, but yeah, I, I think the numbers uh, are important. It's just, it's, I think the three of us would agree it's also, it's always less interesting to me at a party or social thing, or a Uber driver saying, hey, you have a Star Wars shirt on. Um, you know, I didn't like Kenobi. Oh, why? I want to know why versus I heard or the numbers are bad or Obi-Wan never left the planet. Who told you that? Who told you that? No one told you that. No one told you that. Mm. Kenobi didn't tell you that. You don't know. 19 years. This, this show dealt with that. Do you like that versus what did you carry into it? That's more interesting. There. Mm. Uh, any, any final thoughts there before I move on? Mm -mm. Okay. No. We're doing good. We're doing good, team. The groundbreaking success of The Mandalorian is highlighted in the article, arguably a show that set the tone for not only Star Wars TV, but Marvel TV and a lot of other things in the streaming era as it exploded, and definitely the Disney Plus era. But then the article says its fourth season uh, you know, is being moved to a movie. Uh, yet it also uh, uh, looks, oh, it, it said this. Here's the quote. I pulled a quote. That's what it's doing. There's quotations, Ken. Read it. Yet it also looks like Disney spent many years in untold capital struggling to develop a new Star Wars movie, and its best idea was an extra long episode of the TV show. Oh, man, that is cynical. Kenobi was going to be a movie. There was a Boba Fett movie in the works. We know that. That was always rumored. True. Didn't happen. Turned to show. The Acolyte could easily have been developed into a movie. That's just me saying that. Lando, if it comes to light, will be a movie now. So is the statement about Star Wars, quote, best idea being a long episode of a TV show correct, especially considering the pressure to pivot to streaming years back? Joseph, where do you go with that? Oh, I, I I disagree with the take. I feel like it, uh, it it undermines the success and the core emotional reason of why people love Mandalorian and Grogu and have loved the show The Mandalorian to, to describe it as an extra long episode of a TV show. Mm. Movie comes out, maybe some people will feel that way. Maybe you'll feel like he did just take season four and cram it into a movie and it's awkward. Right. Maybe it won't mm. turn out and then I will say, I'm so sorry, I was wrong. But... <laughs> I think from looking at it from both a creative standpoint and a business standpoint, it's really, really a, a smart move. Uh, I think framing it is we've been trying to develop all these things and none of them work. So we got to pivot to this less than solution. I think it's more like I have no evidence for this. I think Uncle Bob Iger swept back in and go, they're the most successful thing. It, even people who don't like, uh, you know, Mandalorian and Grogu or the show Mandalorian. It's mild. They're just like, I don't like it. <laughs> or I liked it and I didn't. 
Mm-hmm. They we have these massively popular characters. Um, why aren't we doing more with them? Um, I think reestablishing Star Wars in theaters with with known characters that people largely enjoy is a, a great move, and and hopefully it can be a really great film onto itself. The other huge huge part of this to me is it's not about the uh, just about the ideas. It's right. It's not like they spread out all the ideas and went, which should we go with. It's also about they know they have a track record of bumpy behind the scenes. This is also about relationships. So instead mm-hmm. of returning mm-hmm. to the theater, but taking a chance on developing a new relationship, why don't we go with John Favreau, who works incredibly well with Disney and has never had any bumps with the mouse. And in fact, has delivered them Iron Man, delivered them the live action Lion King. Uh, the man has had some stumbles in his uh, in his film resume, but mm-hmm. for the most part, he's going to go down in history as one of the most successful directors ever. You have one of the most successful directors ever who also has two of the most popular characters ever who also has a great relationship with the studio. That doesn't feel like settling to me. <laughs> that feels smart. Mm-hmm. Jen, Jen, get in there. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a four center. Well said, and mm-hmm, preach on. Yeah, Jen, it's. On. Can you imagine? It would just be so foolish when you're like you're saying you have this hit show, you have a phenomenal film and TV director who is known to have box office hits. Why wouldn't you put that for the return of Star Wars in? to the movies. It just, it makes so much sense. And it's funny because there's been so much, not so much, there's been some criticism up about the volume and I've had mm-hmm. my share of, you know, Same. gripes Same. about it. Right. Same. So Same. now we're going to, we're, they'll probably use some of the volume, but now we get to have these cinematic moments with these characters is what people have been wanting. So wh- why not give it to the fans? Um, I just think it's, it's, it's pretty brilliant and the time mm-hmm. is now. So it, it's also mm-hmm. about timing. Um, but yeah, no, it's a very cynical take that this. Yeah, it, it's it's so and, and especially just looking again at the at the status of the business the last few years. Uh, would would Kenobi have worked as a movie? Would have worked quote better as a movie? We'll, we'll never know because it didn't get mm. the chance to. Uh, mm-hmm. This was the the idea. This was the pivot. And uh, yeah, there has been a lot of stumbles, and that's why I think there needs to be. Um, you know, they need to show that they've learned some lessons or whatever those lessons are. But we also don't know that they've. They're struggling with the Ray movie currently. There was some uh, a kerfuffle before it coming out of Anaheim Celebration, we heard. But that, that stories, it's reporting. It could be going great. They're just taking the time. We're going to talk later about, quote, getting it right. But uh, yeah, Joseph, you're playing to use um, – uh, I'm in a sports mood, I guess, these days. But it's like Bob Iger returns as a general manager and is going, hey, you, you got this uh, first baseman and this catcher. They're killing it. They were, they were great. Why don't we – Put them at, on the starting lineup. <laughs> Why mm-hmm. are they on the bench? Mm-hmm. Right. And and for right now, when I say bench, bench is streaming TV that is listing across the board and, and is part of many think pieces and conversations. And I think a lot of them correct, Joseph. You're thinking about the narrative and streaming narratives being slightly different and the model being disruptive and, and, and turning into destruction, like all those kind of things. And uh, Uncle Bob comes back uh, and Uncle Bob came back with some bad takes during the strike. Uh, I don't like mm-hmm. all of his sweaters mm-hmm. anymore. But he comes back and goes, hey, hey, uh, hey what about this? I, I, none of this is a bad decision. And it's crazy. I would love to go back in time and tell Ken hanging out uh, in 1996 at my radio station with my friend Megan playing Star Wars Monopoly going, did you see Swingers? God, I love that movie. Hey, did you hear the new Star Wars movie's coming back? And that guy is going to be the one leading Star Wars in a lot of ways in wow. 35, 30 years. That's crazy to me. But the Swingers guy is here, and he has uh, he's a good hand, as they say in wrestling. He's, gonna, he's going to uh, get the job done, and we'll see. Time will tell if it's uh, creatively uh, you know, a success and all this and critically success. We'll see, like we talked about earlier. But I, I think I want to address it. And you both brought up the points and, and made great points um, that I wanted in the section of like, I thought that was pretty unfair. But anyways, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just me. The early, early critical and audience success of The Mandalorian is held against the mixed reactions for other shows. It's all subjective. Uh, we all three kind of like the book of Boba Fett. Others don't. And I've said before, personally, I get why people don't. But here's why I like it. And the like and love of that show is real for me. 
Um, so what do we do with that? Uh, but there's an idea before that the TV site started to slip with the Book of Boba Fett. Yet looking at uh, what came after, that might not even be right. It just might be perception. Talking about the view time and the numbers. And yeah, there's some discussions around Book of Boba Fett that are still there of like, hey, maybe some of that didn't work. Maybe they made some decisions that didn't make sense. But after that, we have these shows, uh, including Andor, Andor, that did pretty darn well. So I don't know if it started to slip or that was just uh, the spinoff that people didn't love as much as, you know, the Tortellis versus Cheers. I don't know. It could be that thing. <laughs> what is our view on the TV side, especially, Joseph, from 2021 on? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are a lot of uh, uh, elements to it. I think it, it is all subjective, and I tend to like the Star Wars that is weirder and wilder and, and wobbles a, a, a little okay, bit, and it's yeah. just kind of bonkers. And I love Book of Boba Fett. It's just bonkers. I, mm-hmm. Attack of the Clones is one of my favorite Star Wars films to watch. I, I don't think like it is the most uh, well made film. I like it because it's kind of bonkers. So subjective is always important. I think another uh, element of this uh, uh, that's important about hey. Streaming makes a big splash with Marvel and Star Wars, utterly unpresented, things we've been clamoring for forever. What, there could be a Scarlet Witch television show? What, there could be Star Wars on my television? So you get that initial explosion, that initial love of these kinds of streaming shows. In terms of numbers, I'll also point out that the majority of the world was uh, locked in our homes. And if, hey, numbers started to dip a little bit Mm. when we all had vaccines, (laughs) Mm. that should maybe also be considered as well um yeah for 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 my personal take um on the the television shows i've enjoyed all of them i think it's the buffet that we've talked about for years on four center and other people talked about that was kind of the dream of of disney star wars and and disney plus in particular like what could you what if you could have lots of different shows with lots of different styles you know uh ahsoka is deep continuity and in, in legacy uh i think acolyte and andor in their own ways were pushing the envelope and encouraging new audiences to join the party you know uh kenobi is a really solid to me if under budgeted addition to the main skywalker saga we're actually getting a little bit of that buffet of like uh oh, you, you you don't like the pasta well there's tacos great mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. somehow that attitude did not emerge with the buffet and i think that's been kind of the 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 mm. challenge of the the conversation for me yeah jen yeah i think it's a challenge that the that the fans want every star wars show to be a mega success and that's just not the way that television has been and some mm. episodes are going to be well known and well regarded and some episodes are not going to be with every show that you watch um, and so, yeah, I love this buffet uh, to me. That's why I'm like, this is amazing. This is what I always dreamed of to have all these different choices, um, and different takes on this beloved franchise. Uh, but obviously not everyone agrees with that. And I think, I don't know, there was just a certain small group that's like with each show that comes out, they're like, this is not what I asked for. I wanted something else. And it's like, all right, here, okay. So it was like every show, they're just not happy, except for and Andor, which wasn't even, you know, wasn't even watched as much as some of these other shows. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I like it all. I'm happy with the buffet. I'm eating well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as a buy. Yeah, sometimes you get to a, a pesto pasta, and you're like, uh, you know, uh, thanks for bringing this, Dave. But I'll I'll, uh, I'll watch something else here. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Um, uh, but not really. Uh, yeah, and Jen, you said something there that I think connects a, to a big thing that Justin said earlier about uh, every every. And this isn't just Star Wars. It's every piece of pop culture is a punching bag. Uh, it always has been. But in that article, the Variety talks of fandom article, they talked about everyone as a bullhorn now. Um, so I, I am I am addressing the quote unquote good faith. I'm not a, not addressing the mm. the bad faith or the toxic fans or the six powerful YouTube channels that control the conversation. I'm talking about uh, the, the person that throws up a camera and uh, a microphone and and does a review of a show. Their natural instincts, even with the best intentions, are to tear it down. Those are when I talk about having green room conversations with comics. These are good people, funny people, talented people, fam- family people. They're raising kids. They're not. They're good part of society. Right? They're good people. And even then when I talk about Star Wars, there's like, oh, why did they do that? That's their starting point. There's this instinct we have as humans to start there, right? I do it about myself. I wake up every day and go, God damn it, I woke up. Like, that's not a good way to start your day. 
uh, that that is the conversation that comes out of every show. That's what's exhausting in Star Wars, Marvel. Lord, Rings, Rings of Power season two is so goddamn good. It's mm. never going to get the eyes on it that it should because people have already written it off because of what some Yahoo with a Tolkien book said about it uh, two years ago. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating. But I'm still happy. Uh, I'm still happy with what's coming down. I'm looking forward to Skeleton Crew. Not everything has worked, but I find the moments. I work really hard. We three worked really hard to find the moments always uh, that connect to us. And that's what's legit and, and authentic about what we do. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna connect to the parts of Ahsoka that I thought ah, a little boring, didn't work, didn't like that. Question that. I'm gonna connect to the moments in that series, which mostly are just you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, rest in peace, Ray Stevens, and looking to the sky. Uh, those those moments moved me, right? Um, I love that stuff. That's what we do here, but it can't help that conversation going on. There. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anything? I, any final thoughts on the TV side? Yeah. Before we move on, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say I, I think you know the the. Uh, Talked about that idea that you just accept it because it's Star Wars. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I had mm-hmm. parts of all of these shows that worked for me and were and didn't work. I think Mandalorian season three did slip in focus because the first two seasons were right. so clear of uh, rescue the baby, find the baby a Jedi. And season three works really well thematically. But I understand how a more casual viewer would be like, what, what, what do I care about this season? Um, Book of Boba Fett, I love those two Mando episodes in the middle are great episodes i totally understand when somebody at at a barbecue is like why the hell were there two mando episodes in the middle of boba fett it was it was bad from a marketing perspective i get that Mm -hmm. kenobi had parts where the the budget did not live up to the importance of those characters um so i i have things about all of them that i'm like i can be a little picky fan too and be like i'll eat the pasta but i'm gonna pull the pesto out (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh so to me it isn't about they're all great and we should never criticize them Mm-hmm. It's about the pulling back to the big picture of why is there a general attitude of negativity when all the numbers, either the numbers have been good or the critical response has been fabulous. Where's the negativity coming from? Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. a part of that for me is just to reiterate quickly that I think the flaw of Star Wars television is the flaw that's a lot of streaming television of moving away from the model that has worked for decades, which is multiple seasons of one show coming out at least once a year so audience can build a deep sustained relationship with the characters the world the behind the scenes creators you can't have a conversation with star trek television without people being like yeah the first three seasons were rocky but then it became the best show ever and i think star wars is offering us a buffet but it's also feeling kind of sweaty because it's like you like this one you like this one you like this one instead Mm -hmm. of having the main star wars television is the acolyte and as soon as season one is done, we've announced when season two is coming mm-hmm. out. Now think about it. Like now season two comes out. And what do you know? You like it even more than season season one. And now mm-hmm. with, when season three comes out, a bunch of stuff in season one makes sense to you to you and all that. Like mm-hmm. that, I think, is the problem. It feels like we're just like, did you like this one? Do you like this one? Do you like this one? We, we need some sustained relationship on the television side. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Very true. The animation side is uh, highlighted uh, as a success. Uh, They sweep through it. This included Visions and Highlights Rebels, which are the two highest rated Star Wars properties uh, in terms of uh, Rotten Tomatoes and things like that and how much you put in that. They do mention Star Wars Resistance to see a show being less impactful two seasons. Uh, We liked it here. Uh, We didn't uh, do deep dives in it as much. Uh, but the show is uh, there for those that want to enjoy it. It's uh, deeper and more adult than I think uh, even the show gets itself credit. Um, but I want to ask this question, Jennifer. Why do we feel that Star Wars animation has seemingly worked better? And I think you could argue it has in some ways in terms of response. Um, some of that might be I would put out there that it's just not watched as much. So there's less eyes on it to criticize it. I don't know. I don't know how much. That's not scientific. Uh, Bad Batch remains my favorite Star Wars TV show at this point. Jen, your thoughts on Star Wars animation? I think it's a smaller audience. I think it's a more, I don't want to say niche, right? But there's a smaller audience that wants to see Star Wars animation. You don't get like a lot of people hate watching (laughs) these Star Wars animated shows. They just don't. Um, And so you get people that are really invested and want the shows to do well and will share that online and share their joys and celebrate it. I just find so much more positivity in the Star Wars animated fan communities than in the live action communities. Um, You know, you don't have those six YouTube channels, you know, doing Mm -hmm. things about 
the woke stuff in the Bad Batch or whatever, right? Like you don't, they just, <laughs> it's just not going to drive the clicks. Um, so in some ways, the Star Wars animation is is safe and protected. It's a nice mm-hmm. community to belong to. I, I like, I like that side. Very well me. It absolutely is. I've mentioned before in here, but Joseph and I sitting in the, the Rebels panel in Anaheim and just kind of looking around and going, wow, there's a special kind of energy in this, in this room. That is yeah. different. There's energy and love in the other panels and rooms, but there's just something special. It, it's it's worn on the sleeves a little bit. But uh, Joseph, uh, your thoughts on uh, animation and how many times did you vote for Visions on uh, IMDb? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't got to doing that yet. I'll get on it. Um, <laughs> I did check both of you. Though, to, Thank, yeah. you. Anyway. Oh, thank, thank you. Anyway, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I totally agree with Jennifer. I think it is. I think it's about less pressure. I think mm-hmm. the animated shows just get to just kind of quietly tell a solid story for a mostly harder core in-depth audience. I think because there isn't as big of a risk um, mm-hmm. there, there's less second guessing and focus grouping. You don't have variety going the third episode of the third season of rebels dipped yeah, <laughs> in ratings exactly. is star Wars done. There just there isn't the same amount mm-hmm. of pressure because of the nature of animation. I think they have to commit to the how many uh, a little bit more consistency of giving them two to three seasons. Um, right. And then I think because of all that, it, it, like Jennifer said, it's just far more pleasant. The the criticism that fans come up with, like like filler episode, gets pointed at a lot of um, animated shows. Right. Like, you agree or you disagree, and that's mildly annoying, but it isn't the same sort of like, I, mm-hmm. I'm not going to ruin my day by saying I really uh, enjoyed the Bad Batch. I'm <laughs> going to ruin my day by saying I really enjoyed the Rise of Skywalker. Oof, yeah. Yeah, that is a different is. fan experience. Other thing I'll say is I think also because there there is this um, all these benefits, uh, the, the animated shows are pushing into new territory in great way. I think Bad Batch had a big willingness to push into new territory uh, tonally. We've gone on and on about a couple of those, let's just say like jaw dropping, uh, emotional, minimalist episodes, uh, particularly with Crosshair that are just so moving and artful and like honestly pushing Star Wars into new and different territories. So I think that's important on the animated side too, is it's successfully doing new things. Mm-hmm. No, well said. Uh, I, I think there's something to be said for, because there is, I'll say, unfortunately, a, a uh, less of an audience for animated shows because of, you know, just old stereotypes. I got a lot of friends who are like, I don't watch cartoons. And, like, and I understand because I don't watch a lot of animated films. I'm not a big Pixar, Pixar fan. Like, I, I, I get it. It's unfortunate because a lot of great stories might be overlooked. So I think there's less uh, and jo- i'm talking about the the other the big the, the big channels or the people that go out intentionally trying to to, to do the grift i think there's mm-hmm. less to pull from mm. i don't know and or i think it's just because of the way it looks and, and it feels and it's and it's unique and i love the way the show's put together but that the, andor is perhaps the wokest of the woke star wars shows ever <laughs> I, know, I know and it is just praised by those but these these are these but, but the, you know, this is just a media, media literacy uh, conversation about, you know, no, Vader didn't go down the hallway in Rogue One to be a cool badass. It does have that effect, but it's a thematic lesson of he, he is so powerful he never gets what he wants. But it, it, it's, they're not there for that, and I understand that. But but Andor, but, but, but the Bad Batch is right next to Andor as the most politically uh, outspoken show in Star Wars. Yes. And you're not getting a lot of red eyes and red arrows and thumbnails for that show because I just don't think – you're going to have – you can't draw in because a lot of people who are supposed to hate it are like, oh, I didn't watch it. It's a cartoon. And I think that's a good aspect of of the smaller numbers. I wish it was bigger. But you know what I mean? Like yeah. I still – like Bad Batch just directly calling for socialism <laughs> for capitalism and, <laughs> and, and directly calling for the, to be politically active or, or to question those. In, it's it's mind-blowing how, how just direct that show is. And it's not in the crosshairs, oh, crosshair, uh, uh, of everything else. But um, <laughs> but uh, as far as uh, why it's seemingly worked better for me is, is uh, Joseph, I think you touched upon it too. Uh, um, but just we, you have more time with these characters. Mm-hmm. And and you're allowed to grow with them. Um, um, we crossed the 10-year this past weekend. I think it was the 10-year anniversary of uh, Rebels debuting. And flashback to me on Jedi Alliance with Maud Garrett uh, uh, saying, oh, I don't like this show. I don't know about this. Hmm. Um, because I had a reaction on one or two episodes. And then the show grew to have some of my personal favorite moments and stories. And it grew. And, and that fan base, like you're talking about, Jen, it's special. That Rebels fan base is not just passionate. It, they're moved. 
Yeah. They're inspired. Mm -hmm. and they're connected. And they the show was allowed to do that. Bad Batch had three seasons and it did do that. And I hope to mm -hmm. God there's another one. And again, resistance, I would ask people, it is it is absolutely um, designed for a, I don't even want to say slightly younger, Joseph, but you know, you know what it, I mean. It, it's, it, it's a it little was. Different. It was advertised as yeah. being for, for younger people. And even though the themes mm. are complex and on point and it's meaningful, there is also just a large volume of cats <laughs> tripping and screaming, which yeah. I personally enjoyed. But the show is pitched younger. And I think because <laughs> of its shortened time, time line and mm -hmm. it's pitched younger, that it didn't end up having the weight that Clone Wars and Rebels and Bad Batch have. And that's mm. not a criticism of the show. I think it was, it's just a different beast. Yeah. But it has some very weighty, uh, uh, very weighty episodes there. Plus, mm -hmm. oh, peep it in the greatest running <gasps> joke in all of Star Wars. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, rounding out this, and we got a couple things to discuss. Uh, uh, oh, scrolling down. All right, let's get through. Uh, what, what does Star Wars TV success look like in the future, Jen? <laughs> what does Star Wars TV? I think honestly, less is more. I, I, I really like mm -hmm. what you're saying, Joseph, about like focusing on one show, which is hard. Like that felt like the Mandalorian was like that, and then mm -hmm. they were like, okay, book a Boba Fett. Now we're gonna do this and do that. Just focus on one. And just let that be Star Wars on TV, that show, and let it kind of ebb and flow as it needs to. Um, I think that would be good. That'd be good. And then they could focus more money on it, right? <laughs> They're not yeah, spreading yeah, their give, resources. Give me, if it's live action, I don't know, give me 16 episodes. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. And I know Andor got more because uh, again, the miss. I want a book on how Tony Gilroy got everything he wanted. And, and I could, you right. know, I'm half joking there. But yeah, anyways, good point. Sorry, Jen. No, no, I agree. I agree. Yes. Give us more episodes, longer episodes, please, please. Mm -hmm. Let it percolate. Let them cook as they say online. <laughs> That's right. Joseph, That's right. Yes. success in the future for TV. I, I agree with the meme. Let them cook. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I think success for TV is, yes, a flagship show. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be new era, new characters. Mm -hmm approachable to all audiences. And I guess I don't even care about being pedantic about the timeline. I mean, something that replicates what the first season of Mandalorian did mm -hmm. of, uh, it, you do not need to know anything about star Wars to get armor. Daddy falls in love with magic baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It, you, mm -hmm. you do not need anything to get into that. And you, in the power of that was building a relationship, uh, with those, with those characters. And I think that's, what you need uh, uh and and a commitment to a minimum of two seasons and take the damn risk and if it tanks after two yeah. seasons you'll if the first season i was like we can't do it then it'll be a two season show if it's mm -hmm. successful great keep it going uh i also think that they should follow the apple model uh apple uh on their streaming service has been able to take more risks because it's the, 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 the that streaming series exists to keep people in there in their market and have their devices and all that. It's not their, their one and only bread and butter thing. And what Apple has mainly done is hire extremely experienced showrunners and go make quality shows. And we'll give yeah. you two or three seasons. And, and you, you get things like for all mankind, which is beloved by myself and my, my wife and Alex and Molly Damon. And it, you know, every party I go to people are like I, the greatest show ever it's on Apple. And it's always a different one because people have a bunch of different shows they love. And almost all of it is extremely experienced television showrunners yeah. given something they love to run with. I think that mm -hmm. would be great. So I think if they had a flagship show that was designed to bring in new people that ran for multiple seasons, and then they peppered in either limited event series that are mm. like across the board, there's no hope. There will never be a, a Kira part two. This is just our Kira limited series. That's it. Or mm -hmm. they did mm -hmm. low budget films that are like, Here's here's a weird experiment of a 90 minute uh, uh, rom-com action adventure in Star Wars. Here's a mm -hmm. 90 minute horror or like we've talked about again. Here's a one off animated film or an animated adaptation of Lost Stars. Things that are designed to be limited event series, because what we have so much is yeah. a bunch of stuff that may or may not be an ongoing television show, which has left us all going like, but I wanted more Boba Fett, but I wanted more Kenobi, but I mm -hmm. wanted more uh, Acolyte, you know, in mm -hmm. I think of that a flagship show and then said, and we can afford um, a movie every year or two, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. 
No, nah, I really like that. I like the idea of a flagship show, all those kind of things. And we'll see. We'll see where the dust settles on just the industry overall. That is a giant factor in everything going forward. Rounding the corner towards the end of this discussion, but looking at some things, we got merchandise and, and Disney parks were brought up here. Not, I'll say one thing that wasn't brought up was video games, books, comics. I mean, the success of the High Republic series, not in, term, not in, not in terms of, of, of books sold because I don't know who's buying books these days. I can – Tell you that by my quarterly earnings statements, but uh, the success of, of how that was received by the fan base. Talk about passionate fan base. The High Republic fans are passionate. Uh, during the presentation, uh, during the the article says that during the presentation in March, remember there was an activist investor who was fighting the company, fighting for control. He accused the company of overspending. Uh, overspending on what? He had some ideas on what they should or should not be spending on in terms of story and. Uh, representation but disney uh did reveal uh that lucas generated nearly 12 billion in total revenue on his four billion dollar investment you mentioned that earlier joseph and uh uh the art article does talk about uh yeah yeah it's pretty good star wars makes money uh merchandising we don't even really know but it is star wars merchandise doing pretty well on the shelves and uh galaxy's edge is talked about uh it, they, they uh, go into a little bit there uh, i I think I, there's bigger discussions on what to do with that land now, but it's been a success. They did mention the Star Wars Hotel not working as part of the larger picture. Fascinating. I know there's a lot of four-hour essays uh, uh, out there by by folks I don't necessarily agree with their takes on things, but it's, it's I'm not familiar with the lands as much, but I know it didn't work. Got it. It didn't work, but it not for effort, not for lack of creativity. There's a whole lot of things going into that there, and it did work for the people who – did go there and enjoy it and all those kind of things. But thoughts on the bigger pictures, the merchandise. Jen, uh, do we even think about the park hotel side of the conversation? Is Disney bad at Star Wars? Do you? I, I don't worry about a hotel uh, yeah. into it. Um, how does this all uh, factor in to your uh, thoughts on this article? I watched that that uh, three hour, four hour uh, d documentary. It, she was actually very, I thought, very measured, and I I was like, oh, I can see why this uh, was not a success. <laughs> I would love it to have been a success. You know, the merchandise is interesting because I always go to Target often and I go through the merch aisle and I see the Star Wars products. I don't, I feel like they're cheaping out on the Star Wars products from where we came from. I ordered an Acolyte shirt from the Disney shop and I was so disappointed with the quality of the shirt. Meanwhile, I ordered a Hocus Pocus shirt. <laughs> I ordered a Hocus Pocus shirt and it is phenomenal quality and it has like all these great details and the quality of the t-shirt is so well made it was more expensive and i had to show my disney plus uh sub that i was a subscriber to disney plus to get that shirt right but i just feel like they're kind of not putting the quality behind the star wars products that that mm. they used to that's just my mm. I, I don't know you guys know better than me but like I, I, although the mini brands thing that was fantastic but other than that like the star wars aisle is kind of bare at Target, it's just like yeah. the same old stuff, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I wonder how much that is the again the industry at large, the toy industry at large versus right. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Joseph, yeah. You, you're buying a little bit more than I am these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the merchandise has uh, ups and downs, and you know, I spent some time in action figure Facebook groups, and Hasbro will do an amazing action figure, and people will be really happy, and then they'll do one where they charge way too much for adding a weird element and clearly cheap out and like lots of it is like how can we possibly replay paint another mandalorian and um and i don't and i think the store the the shelves are often empty because collectors have grabbed them up mm. uh, so that a lot of that emptiness and repetitive is like well that those are the ones that sell and you can't find them in a target I see. Uh, I see. you know so some of that is is good and like look star wars has had lots of ups and downs but the clothes are still selling. People are still going to the park. We all bought those Oreos, for God's sake. A, a dying <laughs> franchise does not get people hyped to eat Oreos for three months, uh, which which they did. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have ups and downs and criticisms about the the way the um the the that Galaxy's Edge should go, but overall it's magical, and I yeah. think it was super smart to not tie it to a specific film. Uh, it's kind of tied to the sequel era right now, but they've, they've stretched with that. And and it's it, it demonstrates the value of the entire galaxy of wanting to disappear into that mood. And and people who, who get to like we have is extremely lucky. Um, last thing I'll say, pe people take the hotel failure as a, yeah, Star Wars is dying thing. And, and I, I don't agree with that at all. I'm ex I, I got to be honest. I'm very defensive about the hotel. 
I think there's clearly things to criticize from the financial perspective. It was a massive experiment and mm -hmm. maybe they did build something that was financially unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the whole uh, a collection of Star Wars and other things we like can sometimes be a pinata or a punching bag, which is kind of fun to hit it. I'm really defensive about how much people have turned the uh, hotel, the Star Cruiser into a punching bag because Disney, the corporation might have gotten too greedy or put out a product that didn't pay for itself. But the actual thing uh, got extremely high scores. Um, I, I, I know a little bit one of the people who worked on designing it. I'm good friends with one of the key castmates. And she shared and continues to share incredibly moving stories about what that meant to people, uh, 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 what it meant to the cast, what it meant to visitors, you know, stories of talking to little kids who, who were truly deeply moved, you know, as, it, it, as an artistic experience. It was a phenomenal success. The corporation Disney clearly didn't do what, what was needed. So for me, it's like, yeah, the corporation took a massive financial swing, but it really bugs me that it's become such a punching bag because the experience for most people was clearly incredibly magical. And, and uh, you know, I, I've heard other people say that that long video is very balanced. The, the headline wasn't. The headline was. I'm trying to remember her headline. I, I can't remember what it was, but the, the way video shared, title, the way it was shared out like with the New York times, the way, obviously the yeah, way it was, was shared very... was very much like we talked about with this article of like the article is actually very measured for the most part. And generally comes to the conclusion of like, yeah, they made $12 billion. They're okay. But the title yeah. is, Hey everybody, let's punch star Wars. Are you bored? Let's punch star Wars. Mm. Yeah. They should have just put it in the freaking park. Sorry. That's what I'm going to say. I, I just, I, I, we would have yeah. a whole other hour on that. I think and that's I, where a lot of the gripes come from is like, we were prom we were promised. They showed us the concept art of what the Oga's cantina or whatever. And we saw like there was going to be a dinner show or whatever. It was going to be, be interactive. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Being a uh, park was going to be interactive. And instead what we got, it just didn't live up to what, quite frankly, what we're paying to get into that park. It is freaking expensive. And I want my kids to, to hang out there. And after Smuggler's Run, they're like, all right, let's go. And it's because there's not a lot to like, unless you want to shell out a ton of money to pay for a droid or pay for a lightsaber, which I'm not going to be shelling out for my kids who are going to just break it in a day. You know what I mean? It's like, it just, it feels... It feels greedy. And I think that's where people kind of were getting like the, the hairs on the back of their neck. We're like, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're paying all this money. And now you want us to go and pay a separate amount of money for a hotel experience. That's extremely expensive. And most people can't afford. Like it just it doesn't feel right. But that's and, what I'll say about that. And I want to be really clear that I 100 percent agree with everything you just said. And to me, those things are all about corporate money related decisions how much yes. do things cost how much mm -hmm. do you deliver on the promise but too often what i see on social media is pointing and laughing at the artistic failure of star wars that mm -hmm. the park mm -hmm. sucks the hotel sucked the movies suck and to me it's like disney's making decisions i disagree with about the numbers and the money and and all, all everything you just said that's different than the art of it the story of it to me. No. Mm. I don't think there's enough at Galaxy's Edge, but what's there is magical to me. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's overpriced magic. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I think it's hard. I th yeah, I don't know. I can't yeah. get my kids to want to hang out there. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. It's, it's supposed problem. to be a magical land that kids want to hang out in. And if yeah. they don't want to, that is a problem. Right. I, I can't afford a lightsaber, but I would like one. So Same. One day. I'll break it though. Uh, actually, I got an Instagram message from an old friend uh, this weekend who was uh, visiting, uh, and uh, it was in Anaheim with uh, her kids. But she took a picture of it. And she said, "I, I didn't. I got here and I started crying. I didn't expect that." Hmm. Um, and so there's still that magic there, but there's the, the business stuff around it. And, I, and I'm with you too, Joseph. I think the defensive side I have, and, and Jen, I don't want to paint you outside of the circle, but I'm just like the fact that this didn't work the hotel it has nothing to do with rise of skywalker or oh, the movies no. or anything like no. that and i think it is kind of lumped in there um 
Wrapping up there, truly. We're actually wrapping up. This isn't entirely Disney's fault, says the article, uh, as I take it out of context. But it's one of the challenges moving forward. How do you make Star Wars feel fresh and new while still feeling like Star Wars and not like, say, Rebel Moon? No disrespect to Rebel Moon fans. That's what the article said. So how do we see Star Wars remaining fresh going forward? I think we touched upon a lot of things in here. Final thoughts on that, uh, Jen, going forward. Uh, the brand. It, it is a brand. How is it going to feel fresh? I don't know. I don't know. I think less is more. I think quality over quantity, not to say that the quality, the quality yeah. has suffered. Right. Mm -hmm. But I just think that, yeah, there's a lot of people who don't like this buffet and they want it to feel a little bit more special and that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe, and a lot of people can't keep up with the buffet and mm -hmm. they can really only handle one thing at a time. So, um, I, I think that that could be good is to, to pump the brakes at least for now, I don't know. Because there still is so much else. Books, mm -hmm. comics, Galaxy's Edge. Right? There's so many other places that we can get Star Wars. It's not going away anytime soon. Mm -mm. Yep. No, I think that's valuable. And I think uh, f they've paused on the films and there's many reasons why. And you, mm -hmm. you can punch and bag uh, affect that or you can praise it, whatever. That's the reality is they've paused and, and uh, I think uh, we'll see. And, and I like that idea of uh, less less can sometimes mean more um and for a lot of reasons they did more as long as well as every other brand uh some better than others marvel yay it's only recently showed cracks and those cracks are up for debate I, i'm not a expert on the marvel side uh dc's been embattled for a long time this is nothing new um but i think uh for me uh, fresh going forward is uh to continue to do what i feel star wars does best which is connect to those core tenets is the reason i praise emotional canon um, more than even just the canon of what is Star Wars about, right? What is Star mm -hmm. Wars about? And no matter who the characters are, no matter the settings, no matter the timeline, and I'm not saying it needs to be in a little box creatively. I'm just saying that magic is contained in kind of these tenets of Star Wars, and I'd love to see that. But in terms of just actual fresh going forward, yeah, uh, new eras, uh, big Jim doing Dawn of the Jedi seems interesting to me. Diving into the five years uh, after Return of the Jedi like we are and will continue to do and just uh, drilling down on some of those new eras. It's an, uh, the Acolyte uh, was trying to do that, and it's unfortunate that that part, uh, that part of the story has come to an end for now. We'll see. Uh, but I like that. Um, but Star Wars is always going to look like Star Wars. It's always going to feel like Star Wars because that's what it is. It's, it's heroes, it's villains, it's lightsabers, it's blasters, it's spaceship. So uh, spaceships like um, make some changes, have fun, take cre creative risks. But it's always going to feel like Star Wars to me. So, uh, Joseph, your thoughts on being fresh going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that has always been the challenge of Star Wars, and it's just a little bit more challenging right now. I think from the beginning, from Star Wars, before it was called A New Hope, what was magical about it, it was a perfect cocktail of the old and the new. It was all these deep themes. It was pulling from Westerns, Dune, Flash Gordon, all sorts of places, uh, and yet turned all of those ingredients to something no one had ever seen before it made made it so fresh and exciting it's a huge challenge and it's just going to continue to be the challenge but that's i think what makes a great star wars is something that feels deeply familiar and poignant and powerful and about us and about our lives but it also has bonkers aliens and weapons and ships and plot twists that you've never seen before that make you feel so excited and and reinvigorated uh to, to live in that galaxy uh for me I think the biggest thing that Star Wars needs right now in this moment is, uh, is three little letters. Uh, <laughs> I was going to spell them out, but then it feels bad because it's like the first two are F U and then N. <laughs> Let's not stop at the F U. F U N. Fun. It needs, yes. I think too much of Star Wars energy has been just F U. Now we yeah. need the N. F U N. Fun. I think mm -hmm. that is a lot of what people are are missing. I've really enjoyed all of the experimentation in the television show. I've, I've television shows, I've enjoyed the variety. Uh, but but some of it's been a little hard edge. We talked about that with, you know, uh, characters are all kind of going through a hard time. I think Star Wars needs to be fun again. It can have emotional weight, big themes. Mm -hmm. But I think we need people to be walking out of theaters, wanting to play Star Wars and feeling safe to talk about Star Wars online because it's fun. Mm -hmm. I like that. F U. And uh, the <laughs> article was titled, Is Disney Bad at Star Wars? Uh, you got to clickbait if you're going to survive. I get it. But the article, as we've discussed in depth, goes through a rundown of here's the last 12 years. And you nod your head and go, yeah, that's all correct. But at the end of the article, it says this. But here's another question. 
Could Disney be better at Star Wars? Clearly, yes. And I do think that's fair, but I think it's fair for everything. Every time I walk off stage, you go, that was great, but I clearly could be better. It's just the instinct we all have, and I don't mind striving for better. I do think that's actually part of the being competitive uh, sports aspect that I like about life, is that was good. What do we do next time to be better and learn from that? That's okay, and I think I'm okay with this article asking this question, but Jennifer, what are some of the could-do-better moments since 2012? And your thoughts on the answer being clearly yes from the article. In terms of story, I don't, I don't really have anything. I, I think it's that you know some things have been the hits, some things have resonated with me, some things have not, and that is okay. That is the beauty of art because it will resonate with someone else. I don't have to watch it if I don't want to. <laughs> That's the choice I have, right? Although we do do this show, so I do have to watch it a little bit. Yeah, but, um, even, but even, but look, even then, you know, we've all said, yeah, sorry, we're not going to listen to the audio book of uh, right. Anakin and 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 Obi Wan after Phantom Menace. We don't have time, time. So, yeah. yeah time right exactly so the only thing i would say that they could do better is handling some of the, some of this negativity and, and the racist um, um uh, mm -hmm. vitriol that's been happening to some of the people um on screen and behind the screen and i think that that's really really important they've got to figure that out they have to they have to address it they have to say this will not be tolerated and they're gonna have to do it over and over again it's just it's just the way that it is um and they have to get comfortable doing it and like you were saying ken there has to be l less of the legal people wringing their hands saying well as long as i say anything there they have to in this day and age because silence is bad they cannot they cannot do that anymore they have to protect their talent they have to protect the creators otherwise guess what people aren't going to want to be a part of star wars because they don't want to get doxxed or get harassed and have to deal with that garbage Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's just the way it is. To this day, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's been an official statement on the Acolyte, right? No. I don't think there has been. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent point. Um, for me, I'll just stay here, Joseph, and I'll let you take us home here. Uh, I agree with you, Jen. Those are some that could could do better moments of, of handling the, the franchise and not being – not so precious with precious with it creative. That's one thing I hear from a lot of friends. Uh, they're just so precious with Star Wars, which is this cynical way of saying that they just tell stories of Obi Wan and people. We know. I don't think that's the case. Look at Book of Boba Fett. They took a character uh, that uh, had six lines and armor everyone thought was cool, and they turned him into something uh, what I thought was wonderful. Other people didn't. They took a shot. They took a chance. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm just about being precious where the walls are so high around the, the these uh, studios literally and, and figuratively, that um, that they don't come down to address some of the stuff and they don't come down to communicate. I'm not even talking about some of the, the stuff you're talking about, John. I'm just talking about news and, and uh, rumors. And I think you need to be more aware of that. That's why I don't have a dog in the DC fight. And I'm not even saying I want to hang out with James Gunn. I don't know. <laughs> but I like that he and Big Jim Mangold, who can, as two older white men, can get on the internet and go, F you, that's not true. That's a lie. That's right. not true. That's the era we're in. And yet, 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 we are not in the 70s anymore. We can't call up uh, Army Archer and say, uh, Army, why'd you, why'd you print that? That ain't true. They don't have fixtures here at the studios uh, uh, hiding bodies. This is, we're in a new era. Everyone has access. <laughs> they're, they're in a parking structure looking down on you. Yeah, I mean, right? when John Favreau kills a guy, we all just know now. <laughs> now we there's know. Nothing, there's nothing to do about it. It's just out there. You have that to was adjust. A joke. Was it joke. was a joke, everybody. You have to, you have to address. Mm -hmm. Every reporter on that train with Babe Ruth hid the truth about him. Mm. You can't do that anymore. And mm -hmm. and you have to just and that's the one big thing for me. As far as the other moments, yeah, you know, hey, maybe not chasing. Uh they're, they're, I think they've been cursed about chasing directors of the moment <laughs> who are no longer in the moment. <laughs> I was there the day in 2015 on Sunday. Well, Ryan Johnson's here. Where's Josh Trank? Uh, he's sick. Oh, okay. Gosh. I wouldn't expect him. I wouldn't have expected Kathleen Kennedy to come out in that panel. Be like, he, he, we, we kind of just fired him. He walked up. We don't, we're figuring it out. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, there's something about that. And, and I, sometimes I don't think they can help it. Sometimes Uncle Bob has a strong thought of what co-directors who deal a lot with animation should be directing solo and maybe puts his uh, full uh, force of his sweater behind his decisions. Uh, that's the kind of stuff happens. Um, but uh, that's one thing that I think they could do better, among other things. But that's it. Joseph, take take me home on this one there. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both of you. I really agree with Jennifer. Star Wars, Disney, Lucasfilm, the entire industry needs to have a better plan for how do we protect 
people so mm -hmm. that being cast in a beloved thing like star wars isn't a curse because mm -hmm. you're a woman because you're black because you're gay uh all those things you you need mm -hmm. to be they need to find a better way to to handle it um for sure uh the behind the scenes drama of you know firing a director halfway through uh, i think creatively it's it, in my opinion it's worked out well but yes that's obviously not good and that could be better i think not announcing a project until like there is nothing short of California falling into the sea that will stop us <laughs> from making this movie. We're not announcing it until we're committed to it, no matter what. Maybe uh, doing better communication about what is announced and isn't. Um, uh, I'm not criticizing uh, the, the director, Sean Levy. He's playing the game, but fans continue to think that Sean Levy has a movie. Sean Levy is pitching them. He's interviewing for a job. But fans think there's a Sean Levy movie that Disney's going to drop. Disney's never said yes to a Sean Levy movie. <laughs> and there's confusion out there uh, about that. And no shade on, uh, again, on Sean Levy or the desire for his movie. It's just about communicating what is announced versus what, what is a creator saying, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to do this. Um, and then mm -hmm. I think, especially on the television side, fewer projects, more support, more commitment, more narrative follow through. Let us fall in love with some characters and let us know they're coming back. There you go. Yeah. 1981, Lucas changed the title of his first Star Wars film to A New Hope, and the name is apt. It's literally what's fueled studio executives, creatives, and fans ever since this, this article. Each time another Star Wars title opens with a rousing fanfare, a scroll, and a star field, all of us get the same feeling, A New Hope, over and over again. That's uh, something I actually really, really agree with in the article. Uh, it was my number one favorite moment in the damn book I wrote because that is it. That pause between a long time ago and a galaxy far, far away, or now the pause of all the helmets uh, flying across mm -hmm. on the Disney ah. Plus screen. There's that pause that comes right before new Star Wars. New mm -hmm. movie, new episode, new book even, new comic. I love that moment. We all come back to that moment. So, um, Jennifer, what is your hope meter in 2024? You can be honest. I know you've struggled. I know you're here. But what, what, is, what is your hope meter when you round that corner and see that falcon at Galaxy's Edge? Oh, my hope meter is high. I'm excited for Skeleton Crew. I think it's going to be really magical. I really, really am hopeful for the show. And I think people are going to be a little bit more respectful, hopefully, because there are children involved. And I just want to say I love the Star Wars social team. Like, they're my peeps. I love them. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's not it's not their fault. There are lawyers mm -hmm. and people and board members and whatever that come down, and I'm sure dictate what they can say and what they can't say. So I just want to make that clear. But overall, yeah, I'm excited to to introduce my kids to Skeleton Crew and hopefully hopefully they'll they'll enjoy it. Um I don't know, but I I think I'm going to enjoy it. And that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Uh my hope yeah. meter is uh is always full. It's always um uh, looking forward to the next story. Uh I have it's been a weird year year for me uh, professionally. Uh, um, some health issues for me, and other thing. And, and I and if coming out of the strikes, Star Wars and I are are in a uh, uh, we're in a that point in your relationship where you're both just kind of sitting on the couch, scrolling, watching uh, Twitter. <laughs> alone, you know? that, that's kind of where Star Wars and I are are at right now. But 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 I'm still here. Uh, are you tuning out a little bit when you ask Star Wars about its day, and then Star Wars yeah. answers, and then yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not listening uh, as well as you should. I, I'm a, hey, Star Wars, where, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know. You choose. No, you choose. No, I don't know. You choose. I don't know. You choose. <laughs> That's kind of been the last year or so with, with me, but I love the stories and I love spending time with it and I love discussing it. Uh, I said recently uh, you know, on the episode, Jennifer and I were together, Joseph, when you're back in Minnesota, I told the story of being at uh, my pal's, uh, uh, Jen Murrow's house and, and some guys in the next room, and I do mean guys, loud, loud guys started getting in a shouting match over Star Wars. And I went in there to explicitly say, I will not join you. And I ended up joining join the conversation because at one point I looked around at all of them and I said, hey, but we agree. We all love this. And they went, oh, my God, no, Star Wars is my favorite thing. Mm. And then we had a fun time discussing it. And that reminded me that I'm still here. I'm still engaged. I can mm. always get excited for the next thing coming. Can't wait for Skeleton Crew. That's my hope meter. Joseph, yours. Yeah, my, my hope meter is high for lots of reasons. I think uh, a lot of these challenges that we've talked about with Star Wars, uh, some, some of them are unique to Disney, Lucasfilm, specific mm -hmm. choices they've made. But a lot of the biggest ones are things that the, that we're wrestling with with streaming, that we're wrestling with with the world. How many of these people who say awful, hateful things 
watch Star Wars at all? How many of them are, mm-hmm. are, are even Ben fans and how many of them are just uh, grifting? How many of them are just mm-hmm. wanting to hold the world back? And this has nothing to do with Star Wars. We don't know. These are a lot of these problems. The biggest ones are problems with our society right now. Do we want to be so negative that it absolutely benefits you to be negative on YouTube, that that's the way to success on, on YouTube and social media? Is that the society we want? Th- those problems are larger than Star Wars. In terms of what's coming next for Star Wars, I'm very excited for Skeleton Crew. I think it might be that just kind of like, yep, it was. it's what they told us on the tin. Some kids got lost. They fought a pirate. Yes. Jude, Jude Law maybe was not going to be nice. And then at the end, what do you know? He was nice. That's mm-hmm. my guess for Skeleton Crew. And I think people are going to just calm the hell down about it. I think mm-hmm. Mando and Grogu is going to be great. I think John Favreau is an amazing director. And I think he knows he to make a big cinematic experience. I think Andor season two will be critically acclaimed. I think fans who've loved Clone Wars and Rebels for years will adore Ahsoka season two. And I think I probably will too. I think a lot of what's coming is is really, really great. And the last reason I'm going to have hope is because it's the point of Star Wars. I think of all the things that Star Wars can be, the biggest thing it's about to me is hope versus fear. The future is coming. Change is coming. You can control your actions, but you can't control everybody else's. You can't control the entire world. And you have a problem staring at you, a crushing problem. And you can give in to fear and say, it's going to go bad. They're all going to hate me. It's awful. I got to be proactive and I got to lash out first. Or you can say, it's really, really hard to hold on to, but I'm going to choose to have hope. I'm going to choose to believe that this could turn out well. I'm going to choose to believe that I could have the strength to do this right. I'm going to choose to believe that that the people who love me will suddenly be there behind me to help me. I'm going to actively choose hope. To me, that's the most essential thing that Star Wars is about is hope versus fear. And it's one of the reasons I love it. So yeah, damn right. I'm going to have hope. Mm-hmm. Hope indeed, hope indeed. And as far as you know, the discussion space and and the idea again that everyone leads with negative, and then there's just outright evil folks out there uh, who have uh, uh, co-opted Star Wars and Marvel and pop culture for a bigger, bigger cause that we need to fight in other ways. Uh, a quote went around this weekend that I saw that I loved, and always check your quotes on the internet. This one is from J.R.R. Tolkien. It might as it could have been Picard. I don't know, uh, but. <laughs> He says, evil is not able to create anything new. It can only distort and destroy what has been invented or made by the forces of good. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why we lead with hope here at Force Center, and we always will. That's my final thought. Any final thoughts over there? I think we've all said a lot here today. I think Picard Mm -hmm. said it best, so I think we should leave it at that. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. Hey, we are Force Center. You can find us on social media at Force Center Pod, as we said up top. We are focusing on Blue Sky Threads, Instagram as well. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're available as a podcast in a lot of spots. Just search. You'll find us. Uh, Leave us a review on those sites, too, as well, if you want to help us. Merch available at two spots, TeePublic, tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. Or if you're uh, watching on YouTube, there's a link to our fourth wall shop that we're slowly building. Patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly. Get into our Discord. We we have a great group of uh, listeners and, and viewers that hang out in our Discord if you want some of that old F-U-N fun discussing <laughs> Star Wars. It's there. Follow me at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, KenNapsock.com. I mentioned a couple of times I would love to sell a couple copies of my book, Why We Love Star Wars. Uh, it's on my shop on my website, KenNapsock.com. Sign copies available there. Jen, where can they find and follow you? You can find me on all those social media sites, at Jennifer Landa, TikTok, at Jennifer Landa, 1138. There you go. Joseph is going to take a big swig of water because we talked a lot, but take us home, sir. Yes, you can find me on all the social media at Joseph Scrimshaw. Uh, speaking of hope, uh, I'm going to need a lot of it uh, to get this uh, film made. Thank you all for who did the weird experiment of uh, clicking on that IMDb link. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to help me get this film made, uh, there's a link on my website. Uh, my website is josephscrimshaw.com, and there's a link to an organization called Film North that can take uh, one-time tax-deductible donations that go directly to the budget of uh, the film. Uh, everyone listening, uh, you owe me nothing. And you have been extremely generous to me and to Force Center. But if you'd like to, to help me, uh, I could really use some <laughs> Battle of Exegol energy and lots of little ships showing up uh, on that film North page. So if you want to help me out, now would be an amazing time. But again, uh, you owe me nothing. And thank you for all the support that you've given uh, to all of us. I love this. Some Hollywood bigwigs going to be like, how did, how did Scrimshaw raise all these producers? <laughs> they're not producers. They're, they're just people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's it. We'll see you all next time here on Force Center.